All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, hope you had a nice lunch. My name is Daniel Helden. I'm a um, medical doctor and residency within pediatrics and also a PhD student at Karolinski Institute. And I will be co-hosting this session on water together with my eminent colleague, Professor Birgit Arnheimer. You could perhaps say a few words about yourself. Well, I come from the Swedish Metrological and Hydrological Institute, so not much, so much into health problems, but I can tell you something about water, uh, which might be useful for you in your research. Absolutely. And we are very excited for this hour. Um, uh, it's going to be quite hectic. We have a lot of speakers, uh, so we don't want to waste uh, anybody's uh, time. Uh, first, we're going to have a bit of a broader outlook, actually. Uh, we have with us uh, today Matthias uh, Frumery, who is the uh, climate ambassador uh, at, uh, in, at the government level, who will be giving a short talk uh, uh, looking more broadly at the engagement on the global level. And then we will move more into the focus of the session on water. So without further ado, Matthias, please take the stage. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's such a, a pleasure and privilege to be here. Uh, and as you said, I'll be doing a bit of a more sort of broader outlook on where we are in terms of global climate action, not specifically on, on, on water, but I'll try to, to uh, reference a couple of uh, uh, points there as well. So my name is Matthias Römer, Swedish climate ambassador and head of delegation to the UNFCCC. Um, I'm now heading towards my, my fifth COP uh, in Dubai, uh, leaving next Tuesday. We'll be there for an intense two weeks. Um, it's going to be a difficult meeting, is the sense uh, that we have. Um, there are a number of issues uh, on the table for us to, uh, to negotiate. Uh, and my sense is also that we, as we are progressing on the transition to net zero globally, also the various fault lines are being more exposed. So where countries are seeing you know, that they need to change, uh, and that changes might not be happening as quickly, uh, or rather the changes are happening too quickly for some, some countries, and therefore there is a stronger interest also from some countries sort of to hold back to the extent that they can. But as we all know, I mean, I think you've, you've covered that already this morning, and I'm sorry I couldn't be here with you then, but uh, I mean, we are lagging behind uh, when it comes to, uh, not least when it comes to emissions. Um, I mean, we have, we've had a recent a number of re reports just recently uh, highlighting where we are in terms of emissions and I mean, both from the IPCC, but also from UNEP and other organizations, highlighting where we are in terms of that, uh, you know, we, we might be reaching, uh, we might be on track towards 2.4, 2.6 uh, degrees of temperature rise, whereas we should be, of course, at, in accordance with the Paris Agreement aiming to 1.5. Um, the IPCC tells us that we need to cut emissions by almost half by 2030, uh, and uh, the, the latest um, compilation of the level of ambition globally points us rather to that emissions will be sort of maybe reducing by 2% or something by, by uh, 2030. So there's a huge gap there in terms of the level of ambition uh, where we're headed. Uh, and uh, you know, that is, of course, one opportunity, uh, the COP meetings are one opportunity for us to highlight where, you know, what we can do jointly in order to sort of to close the emissions gap. Um, and sometimes people ask me, so how important is this COP in relation to other COPs? Uh, and uh, I've, I've uh, for the, you know, started saying that every COP until we close the emissions gap is the most important COP ever. You know, almost referencing the or paraphrasing the what they used to say at least within the Olympics. You know, saying that this was the best Olympic Games ever. We need to have the same kind of approach also to the COP meetings. You know, this needs to be the COP uh, where we can deliver uh, uh, the solutions for us jointly going forward. But as I said, our sense is that it will be difficult, um, partly because of as I said, sort of the fault lines are becoming more exposed, and as we are progressing in the transition to net zero, more and more countries are, or some countries are also seeing that you know, they need to hold back because they're not re really ready maybe to take those kind of steps uh, as of yet. So from our approach, you know, from, <clears throat> from the Swedish and the EU side, what we're trying to do, not only at the COP meetings, but throughout the year, is sort of to provide a sense of direction in terms of where we're going and where we can be going. 
uh, we're highlighting from the Swedish side uh, are two key messages, is urgency and opportunity. So urgency based on the science, but also opportunities based on what we see that the transition brings in terms of new jobs and growth. And hopefully we can be sharing those kind of solutions with partners globally in terms of how we can jointly accelerate the transition to net zero in countries across the world. I was just now this morning uh, uh, seeing all the Swedish companies which will be at COP28 uh, as part of the Swedish business pavilion, um, where it's so encouraging to see the number of solutions that these actors can offer in, you know, in, a, in a wide range of sectors. <clears throat> and of course, this is not sort of, uh, this is not only in Sweden, but we see this in a, in a number of European countries, not least, uh, where the transition is gaining pace and where we can see that these solutions are being presented to accelerate the transition to net zero, be it in steel or transport or energy or within agriculture uh, and so forth. So that is what we, the approach that we hope to bring to COP28 and the approach which we hope to be sharing with our partners globally and with the number of actors which uh, will be present at COP28. This will probably be the biggest COP meeting ever. Um, we have seen sort of the, the, the number of participants growing uh, over the past couple of years. My first COP in 2018, I think we were 24,000 participants, I mean, still a big meeting. Um, last year in Sharm el Sheikh, there were some 48,000, and this year in Dubai, um, we're expecting some 70,000 participants. Note that the number of participants itself is sort of, you know, provides for uh, a robust outcome, but I think we want to see this at least as a, as a reflection of the increased engagement by various types of actors throughout the world in terms of how they want to be contributing mm -hmm. to accelerating the transition to net zero. So just a couple of words on sort of what's on the agenda in terms of the negotiations. The key element for us uh, at COP28 uh, will be what we call the global stock take. Uh, and this is the first time since the Paris Agreement that this stock take will be done. It's enshrined in the Paris Agreement, so we have already agreed you know, that we should be doing this. It's a process which has now been ongoing for the past couple of two years, where there have been a number of reports being done and produced in terms of where we are. And the key element for negotiation at COP28 will be where we're going from here. So what do we do with these results? For us, of course, it's obvious, you know, we need to accelerate, we need to sort of, we need to be encouraging countries to put more ambitious policy frameworks in place in terms of uh, driving a transition <clears throat> in, in all countries globally. The, uh, the key outcome, uh, as we see it, is um, a call to all parties, that is all countries, to come forward with a new and more ambitious NDCs or the nationally determined contributions, which is sort of the vehicle which is designed in the Paris Agreement for countries to present what they intend to do in order for them to sort of be part of the collective effort to, minim uh, to limiting temperature rise to 1.5. And these NDCs are also uh, scheduled to be presented every five years. Uh, so the global stock take will be sort of an, an input to the uh, the direction which countries need to be taking in terms of the deliberation or elaboration of the new NDCs, which are to be presented ahead of COP30 in 2025. And what we want to see coming out of COP28 is a call to all parties saying that you need to update your NDCs, they need to cover the whole of the economy, they need to cover all gases, uh, and they need, to be, they need to represent an increase in terms of emission reductions uh, in relation to your present NDC. So for us within the EU, for example, we have a joint NDC, which we presented uh, a revision just uh, a couple of weeks ago, based on the negotiations within the EU on the so-called Fit for 55 package, where we say that we will be reducing EU emissions by at least 55% by 2030. Commission estimates even point to that we'll be re reducing our emissions by 57% by, uh, by 2030. Um, and there's also, there's even enshrined within the EU climate law that within six months after the completion of the global stock take at COP28, the Commission needs to put forward a new target for the EU for our 2040. Uh, for 2040. Um, and there's also, there's already that conversation ongoing within the EU in terms of sort of what the level of ambition which needs to be set for our 2040 target. Some have suggested that we need to aim for a, a reduction of 90%, some are saying 80%. Uh, 
that's of course something you know first the commission needs to be putting forward their proposal but i think it's an important sign from us within the eu that we are prepared after the completion of the global stock take to come forward with a new um, a new ndc or a new target for uh, 2035 and 2040 so that is sort of the, the key outcome uh, as we see it from cop 28 um, where we have to sort of be negotiating on that particular text saying uh, that all countries need to come forward with more ambitious NDCs. And of course, one could say you know, that this is already part of the Paris Agreement that parties should do this, come forward with new, these new NDCs. But what we're hearing is like from countries like India, for example, who are saying, well, we see the, the GST or the global stock take primarily as an exercise where we see that we need to do more, but it is you, the developed group of countries, we just need to do more. You who haven't fulfilled your earlier pledges when it comes to emission reductions, for example. So that is, I think, what we the key element which we'll be negotiating at COP28, sort of to how to frame that, uh, those different approaches. Uh, you know, who should be doing more? And I think, and from our, from the EU side and from Sweden, we'll be advocating for you know that all countries need to do more, and specifically the G20, uh, who account for 8% of all global emissions. But of course, we also need to see this, as we call a balanced approach uh, across the various um, areas of the Paris Agreement. So it is not only about emissions, but of course also about uh, finance, about adaptation, about loss and damage, um, where um, for many developing countries, not least, you know, it's not about emission reductions, but rather how can you sustain development without increasing your emissions uh, and maybe also focusing even more on adaptation. Uh, so how do you sort of how do you create more resilient societies which can withstand the kind of impacts you're already seeing from climate change? And when you talk to countries uh, where, with colleagues from the, the Caribbean islands or from the from the Pacific, they're of course already seeing the impacts. You know, you you might have seen the uh, the recent agreement between Australia and Tuvalu where Australia agreed to, sort of, to host migrants from Tuvalu who no longer can live on their islands because uh, of, sea, uh, of the sea level rise uh, or other reasons uh, driven by climate change. So in many countries of the world, of course, you're already seeing the impacts to such a degree that you know, it's not emission reductions is not really the focus of, of what we're doing, but rather uh, adaptation. And, and also the issue which we then call loss and damage, where uh, you know, there is a that would be a key item also coming out from COP28 in terms of how we can finance uh, those, how can we support those countries who are uh, being hit by these kind of climate-related disasters over and over again. Uh, I realize I just have one minute left, so just sort of to round this off, uh, and, and maybe sort of again looking at the, the wider picture of COP28, because since we have this large number of participants, it's not only about these, what we call the negotiated outcome, but also increasingly about what's going on outside of negotiations. And for example, this will be the first time where we'll, there will be a dedicated day for climate and health. Uh, there is a negotiation ongoing on a declaration, uh, which will be issued on, I think it's on the 3rd of December, uh, where uh, countries will then come together sort of to outline <coughs> measures that they see they can be taking to support the interlinkage between uh, climate and health. Uh, and spe specifically on water, I mean, comes in both when it comes to mitigation measures, but also maybe even more so when it comes to adaptation measures. And an issue where more and more also countries are highlighting the links between sort of climate action and, and uh, water resources uh, more, uh, more generally. Um, so, um, to sum up, we're looking forward to uh, an intense uh, two weeks. Um, again, it's going to be a difficult meeting, but also an opportunity to highlight the results that we've seen for the past year, and also, of course, pointing to uh, the coming year and the coming uh, couple of years when it comes to the new NDCs and what countries jointly need to do to make sure that we can live up to the targets we set ourselves in the Paris Agreement. Thanks. Yeah, you can stay up here. Yeah, so so thank you so much. I'm sure we're all really interested and want to learn more. And maybe we have to have a follow-up when we have the follow-up discussion in the spring for you to come and maybe for your partners as well. 
Um, but we have time for one, two, three questions. And to kick it off, of course, we are here researchers. And I think many of us, uh, not me, but perhaps a, a bit of a senior generation has contributed to the evidence behind going behind the negotiations. Where do you see researchers having a place and what, what, what kind of role does research play trying to um, further and help combat the climate change on a global level through these negotiations, for example? Well, I mean, again, coming back to our key messages on urgency and opportunity, I mean, uh, urgency is definitely, I mean, it has its foundation in research yeah. and the kind of the re evidence that research provides in terms of what we need to be doing. Uh, and of course, we're very happy to have Marco as part of the delegation who sort of uh, is the, uh, the, the, the bearer of, of science for us within in the Swedish team. Um, and something which it is hopefully sort of is is the, the foundation for uh, for we, what we're doing within the negotiations. But I would say that more generally as well, um, you know, the the more voices that are being heard, the better. Um, and also not sort of within our own societies, but also of course globally. Uh, and to the extent that you, within your various research collaborations with partners in other countries, uh, can be working together to sort of to amplify. Uh, those voices in all countries. I think that's sort of a, also another key um, contributor, which uh, the research community can can be part of that uh, in terms of um, raising awareness. Because I think we we are awareness is 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 growing, uh, and in some cases it's you know it's it's very it's very much present. But still, I would say in many countries across the world um, there is. Um, the sort of um, you know the, the lack of urgency which we're seeing, uh, at least for me, points to the fact that you know we need to keep reminding each other mm. of that urgency. And here, uh, research and academia has a key role. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. I had a question there from Jose. Maybe you you mentioned that everybody has to do more, but we know that there's some countries. You mentioned India that think others should do more. There is an argument, uh, historical reasons really. You have a, the Western countries, industrialized country, have a very big share of what's out there already. So, what's your response to that? How, what is in your mind the, the just agreement? Well, I mean, I, there have been attempts, uh, <laughs> or maybe not attempts, but I mean, it's part of the conversation. I would say that you know, is there a way to? Uh, sort of divide, uh, you know, what or say to countries, this is what you should be doing. I mean, we, we did that in a way in the Kyoto Protocol, where developed countries actually took upon themselves, you know, to say we will be cutting emissions by certain percentages and so forth. So it has been done, um, but I mean, the whole the construction of the Paris Agreement is, in a way, voluntary contributions to a common goal, um, and I don't think we would have had an agreement otherwise. Um, so, how do we? And that is also sort of one one um, a basis for our approach when it comes to climate action globally and highlighting the opportunities as well that we see for all countries to be embarking on this. Um, we will still be having that conversation in terms of you know you who should be doing more. Um, I think it's difficult sort of to to determine um, and but but I mean I think the the way that we approach is is very much to be looking at you know where are the emissions right now. Um, and 80% of global emissions are from the G20, and China is the largest emitter. So obviously, to be able for us jointly to be limiting temperature rise to 1.5, you know, China, India, Brazil, Russia, they all need to be part of that picture. Uh, and we need to be, all of us be, need to be doing more. Okay, we, we have one more question up there, please. Um, yes, thank you for a very good summary of what's happening at COP. Uh, I'm Francesco Fusonerini. I'm a director of the KTH Climate Action Center, so a center working with adaptation and mitigation. And we do work quite a lot of in analyzing NDCs and trying to compile what they mean all together. And one thing you see from uh, especially countries in the global south is a lot of commitments that are conditional to some sort of help or climate finance. Uh, but we do see climate finance lagging behind. So how do you see that conversation going on at the next COP? Do you think there might be some extra commitment? Or also, what's the position of Sweden on increasing climate finance? I'm, I'm quite curious. 
No, I mean, finance is a key element of any COP, um, and it will be at this COP as well. Um, there was just um, uh, reports coming out from the OECD just the other day where uh, they are pointing to that we will be reaching, or we might have reached already, uh, the, the so-called 100 billion target already last year. Um, so I mean, we should have reached, reached it 2020, but it looks like that uh, we reached it uh, last year in 2022. And that has already sort of been uh, received positively by, by the COP presidency, for example. So hopefully it's sort of that will be an issue which will be less discussed at COP28 in terms of the non-fulfillment of that goal. Um, but, I mean, we, of course, as, as uh, you know, the developed group of countries, we realize that we, we have a commitment. Uh, we need to be supporting our developing country partners. Uh, next year, we'll be setting a new goal, which will be the successor of this 100 billion goal, so which will be set from a floor of 100 billion, so it will be even larger. And we, of course, from the Swedish side, we look forward to contributing to that as well. I mean, the Prime Minister said already last year that we'll be increasing our climate finance, uh, so that's sort of the, the direction for, for, for ourselves. Um, but what we're seeing, maybe more importantly, that all countries need to work with is the transition of financial flows more generally, which is a commitment we made also in the Paris Agreement, where we're saying that you know, all financial flows need to be supporting the implementation of both limiting temperature rise and creating more resilient societies. And that is about very much sort of setting regulatory frameworks on a national level to support that, that kind of transition. And you know, when we're speaking to Swedish banks, for example, they're saying they will not be providing credit to their clients unless they, their clients can prove that their business is Paris aligned. You know, that kind of movement we need to see globally. It's happening within the EU and other, other jurisdictions as well, but we need, to be, we need to see that as a global movement also within developing countries. And maybe we can allow one more question. You yeah. had a question also? Okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, I'm Gustav Gielitz from the Berlin Center. So uh, it was in interesting to hear about the directions that Sweden are trying to push at COP28. I was wondering if you could, could you comment on the possibilities for, you know, for Sweden to, to, to push an agenda in the negotiations being part of the EU, contrary to countries like Norway and Switzerland that might be, be a bit more nimble in their own, pushing their own agenda on the challenges <coughs> and opportunities of being part of the EU? I would hope that we within the EU can be nimble as well uh, as Norway and, and Switzerland. But no, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, we see it as a, uh, you know, when the EU comes to the negotiations with our you know, strong negotiating mandates, I mean, I, I perceive us at least to be sort of at the forefront of the negotiations, providing, for example, now what a key element in the EU mandate to COP28 is to push for the phase out of fossil fuels. I mean, there will be other countries voicing their support for this as well, but you know, for the 27 EU member states coming with a joint position like that, uh, to any kind of negotiation is, a, I mean, I would say is is a show of strength. And of course, obviously, there's a you know, throughout the year an ongoing conversation within the EU to arrive at these negotiation positions as well. So, I mean, I, I of course, you know, I can sometimes, you know, when I <clears throat> talk to my Norwegian or Swiss colleagues, for example, I mean, their possibility to engage in the negotiations is different from ours, absolutely. But we then can find other avenues as well to be expressing how we see the, the, uh, the direction of travel. So hopefully we'll sort of get the best of both worlds, in, both within the EU, but also acting uh, you know, in, on a more, what we call, bilateral level. OK, thank you very much. Thank I think you. it's excellent that you could come. <laughs>
data that is relevant for your studies. So this one is in Swedish and it's a service that we developed um, and we launched it a year ago from SMHI. And here you can find actually a lot of in-depth indicators. If you look at this um, uh, and you can find then indicators uh, with impacts, climate impact on uh, weather variables, but also on hydrological variables and oceanographic variables. If you want to make projections for the future and you have such data in your, in your model assumptions, I recommend you to go there if you want to make studies of, of Sweden. And then we have uh, developed this similar service, actually, which is global. And we did this uh, on requests uh, together with the um, World Meteorological Organization, but on requests from the Green Climate Fund. Because Green Climate Fund is the mechanism, the financial mechanism to include or to um, implement uh, climate adaptation measures in low and middle income countries. But they found that in their applications, um, they, the data, the science, uh, behind the different proposals or suggestions were so poor. So because people had difficulties to actually find climate data so that they could argue for why they needed the data. So this was an obstacle for the, for the fund to actually uh, yeah, get rid of their money or to <laughs> provide their money to, to implementation projects. So we did this one and, and it's a tool that can be used uh, also in research, actually, because it has different entrances. Uh, we have three different uh, applications, you can say. So one is the site-specific report, which is very easy, where you can get access to data for a specific site um, yeah, directly. Uh, and the other one is the data access platform, which is a bit more complicated, where you, but where you can also download uh, data and indicators in a very smooth way. And the third one is a knowledge base where we go through all the terminology and this language that is used by climate scientists, but it's not always so easy for someone coming from another discipline to actually understand what is meant. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, and, and behind this portal, we actually use all the IPCC uh, model data. So we have the same information as within the IPCC, but we kind of wrap it up in a more simplistic way for uh, users who have a non-climate expert background. So that's the purpose. But we have done a lot of data crunching to, to get into those simple indicators. So we have used the global um, climate models, we have used the regional climate models, we have corrected them against different observations, and then we have run them through also hydrological models to get water variables, uh, and then we present this um, in different ways, in, in a simple way in this system. So here you can see the different indicators that we work with, and we are happy to get feedback on, on new indicators that we could produce for you when it comes to weather and water variables that are useful for your science. So please uh, give me, send me an email or go into the system and use the contact form and you can actually ask us to, to develop new uh, indicators because this is a work in progress. We did this together with people. We created the system, we co-designed it uh, with people from some low and middle income countries and especially their met offices on hydrological institutes and so on to see what kind of data they needed and how it should be uh, displayed to be understandable. Uh, yeah, so this is just shows this uh, site-specific report I told you about. So here you can go actually on a specific point um, to get information about that specific point. And you get some uh, top indicators that are the most popular ones that people ask for. But then you have a long list and you can go there and click and you can see how many models agree on this one. Is it robust or not? And, and you also get some key messages and you get some pictures or graphs and so on. So a lot of information is 
is available here and you get it instantly when you, when you click on it. This data access platform, as I said, a bit more complicated, uh, but here you can, on the other hand, you can choose a specific, um, a specific model or a specific um, a mission scenario, uh, etc. So this one, a bit more complicated, but you get more uh, precise information of what you're looking for. You can twist and turn a globe and, and look at the, the spatial patterns of different um, indicators also. And then the knowledge base, uh, which ha then has a lot of information that can be useful if you do these kind of systems, but are not a climate expert yourself. Okay, climate change also impacts water quality, because in the, those systems I talked about, it's only water quantity. But water quality is, of course, also very important. Uh, and here it's interesting to see that both um, uh, uh, wetter conditions give poorer water quality, because then you get a flush from the soils of water that, uh, or, or pollutions that are stuck in the, in the soils, or you get a flush from the surface with pollution getting into the water courses. But on the other hand, if you have drought condition and, and uh, low uh, flow in your rivers and so on, you get much higher concentrations of the pollution. So that will also give poorer water quality. Um, but we will hear more about this, and I will end this now. The problems with, with water issues is normally that you have too much, too little, or too dirty water. Um, and the water, is, the water cycle is very dynamic, and it will change in the future. So then you need to know how is it going to, to change, and what can we do about it. So as we just heard, heard from Matthias, uh, in water, it's very much about adaptation. Uh, so we will have two talks now. Uh, Sara will start talking about water quality, how this will change and what we can do. And then we will have Tarsis talking about too much or too little water um, and consequences and what we can do about that. OK, that's all for me. So I suggest that we leave immediately to, to Sara. I was last, it's fine. Oh, I don't think so. Was she lost? Or? Okay, sorry. <laughs> do I have to open it? Or? Do I open that? Okay. Um, whoops. Okay, how do I get to the beginning? <laughs> I don't know. It just jumped to the, oh, hmm. the middle. Sorry about that. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Dickin, and I'm a lecturer at Uppsala University at Swedost, which is a center on global health, sustainability, and transformation. Uh, but uh, until recently, I also worked at the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, so some of the work I'll talk about today is also to get, uh, work uh, in collaboration with those colleagues, as well as a number of WASH practitioner organizations around the world. So I'm going to be talking about water sanitation and hygiene, and two of the, the important gaps that I see and the priorities that we need to address <coughs> from a climate action perspective. So first of all, we've been talking a lot about the climate crisis, but at the same time, there's also a water and sanitation crisis. So at the moment, one in four people lack access to safe drinking water. Um, and this is even worse for sanitation. One in two people lack access to safely managed sanitation. This is also very uneven around the world in terms of the trends. Since I'm Canadian, I wanted to mention that um, in Canada, Indigenous peoples on First Nations reserves are 90 times more likely to have no access to running water compared to other Canadians. So we see significant health implications from poor wash. Uh, we saw with the, the first chart today, I think, in the introduction, those risk factors, if we look not globally, but just in the least developed countries, we see that it's respiratory infections, malnutrition, and uh, diarrheal disease, all of which are closely linked to poor wash. Uh, 
so there are a lot of links to the climate crisis as well. So we already heard a little bit from Barrett, but uh, flooding damages water and sanitation infrastructure. So a lack of sanitation and, and damage to wastewater systems means environmental contamination, which also contaminates drinking water sources. Floods can also damage drinking water sources, leading to poor water quality and waterborne disease. Uh, droughts also are important. You, in many uh, water and sanitation systems, you actually need a minimum level of water to run those systems. Uh, water scarcity also increases collection time, particularly for women who are most responsible for this in many low-income countries. Um, it can also concentrate pollutants in the, the water that there is, and also hygiene behaviors decrease because there's just not enough water uh, to practice safe hygiene. Sea level rise is also important. Um, saline intrusion, so salt in drinking water, is, is particularly important for certain vulnerable groups. So pregnant women, for example, because of the risks of preeclampsia. And then we also see changing temperature and precipitation patterns that influence disease transmission. So for example, warmer temperatures are linked to diarrheal disease. Um, and this is not just when we're thinking about human waste um, coming from so human sources. Uh, we're also seeing more recently, we also need to think about the zoonotic uh, part of diarrheal disease, which of course becomes much more complex when we're trying to think about how to manage that within WASH programs. So the first gap I wanted to mention is that often we think about the impacts, but WASH services themselves are also uh, contributors to climate emissions and have environmental impacts. So nutrients, um, when we, we don't have safe sanitation, so if you think about those one and two, the other half there, um, wastewater entering the environment causes environmental degradation, eutrophication. The services themselves actually take a lot of energy to run. So there are emissions indirectly related to running wastewater treatment, for example. And then there are also emissions from decomposition of waste, so anaerobic decomposition. There was, and this is, um, there's some recent work showing this can actually be a fairly large uh, source of emissions on a city level. This is some work in Kampala. They found that up to 50% of the city emissions uh, were related to poorly managed sanitation. So this is pit latrines and anaerobic uh, processes in pit latrines that release methane. We've been doing some work now reviewing emissions from all sanitation systems. Um, these are all different types of sanitation systems. and. Uh, You can see on the left here, pit latrines and septic tanks. More than 3 billion people use those around the world. It's going to grow to 5 billion people. And we can see that these are so important sources of methane. Uh, so this is important to think about, for example, when Sweden is, is doing development cooperation and making investments, to think about how we can address these emissions from sanitation systems when, again, we're addressing that other 50% that currently don't have sanitation, and then moving towards providing these kind of services. So you would think that this is then an important aspect um, in countries' NDCs, these types of emissions. We did an analysis using SCI's NDC SDG Explorer tool, which are connect it, it looks at the connections between the NDCs and the SDGs. We looked at goal six on water and sanitation. And uh, we saw for goal six that 9% of the NDCs related to um, sanitation or wash, sorry, 9% of all NDCs related to SDG 6. But if we just look at those particular NDCs, we see that only 2% actually related to sanitation and 4% on wastewater. So we can see from the climate policy perspective that sanitation and wastewater haven't really been included to any large extent. It's also mostly adaptation activities and mostly coming in low and middle income countries. So some of the largest emitters in terms of wastewater emissions like methane the US, India, China, they didn't really have any activities. These are concrete activities in the NDCs, not just a, a vague mention. And then, as you may know, there, they have been updated NDCs, but we see that, relatively speaking, there's actually a decrease in NDCs related to SDG 6. So, so progress has, relatively speaking, gotten worse. The second gap I wanted to mention is better addressing the structural drivers of vulnerability in relation to water and health. So the IPCC actually says that um, 
basic public health measures are actually very important for reducing climate vulnerability, very high level of confidence. At the same time, uh, climate finance is generally not approved for upgrading very basic sanitation services or even providing any sanitation services in the case of defecation, so flying toilets here in urban areas. Where there's no sanitation, climate finance will not cover this. Um, and this is because uh, currently of a, a focus on climate proofing, so upgrading technologies, and the funding will only cover, for example, just raising a toilet above the flood level. So I wanted to give a quick example of looking at why it's important to address these structural drivers of vulnerabilities, not just to do the technology upgrades. This is looking in uh, West Africa. I think we'll hear more about this region. So, but importantly, uh, it's facing increasing dry spell lengths and um, variable rainy seasons. So here we've been looking at uh, women's experiences of water insecurity because they are the ones most burdened with those water collection tasks. And we can see that in general, they face high levels of water insecurity with implications for their health, but it also differs among different ethnic groups and how people are using water. So for women who um, are using water for, for businesses as well as domestic purposes, they have a little bit less vulnerability, but they also are more vulnerable to the water scarcity issue of not having enough water. Other groups of women um, who are more pastoralists are more vulnerable to the, the water quality issues um, because they use dug wells, which are more remote and more likely to be contaminated due to animals using them as well, for example. Um, OK, so I have one minute left, so I'm not going to go into that much more detail. But I just wanted to say that, um, so what we can see is that these different needs that women have are not really being taken up into climate adaptation processes. So women are rarely involved in decision-making roles when it comes to adaptation. We can see in these same communities here, a community meeting where men are presenting the, the water situation in the communities. So I'm just going to skip to my last uh, slide here. Um, just, just to say that uh, what we're doing now is trying to look at the links between women's empowerment in relation to water and adaptive capacity to climate change. We're hoping to show that there is a, a strong link between these two because this will provide more evidence for why we need to invest more in gender mainstreaming as well as social inclusion when it comes to climate adaptation, not just the technology upgrading part. And we're just adapting some of these existing indicators for adaptive capacity to a WASH context. So I'll end there and also um, thank you to these funders of this work. So do we have questions to, to Sarah? So, so maybe I have a question then. Uh, there's been, uh, I'm studying mostly on focusing on child health and there's been an ongoing discussion if the, uh, usually you have a, a better health if you are in an urban setting, mm -hmm. but now there's talk about this reversing that's actually the context on rural places is getting better and the mm -hmm. environment in urban settings is getting worse, worse both with in terms with water and sanitation and food and air pollution and so on. Um, have, have you seen this kind of uh, uh, association in your research within water and sanitation? Or is it, do you see that rural urban divide? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the general trend is that urban areas are better in terms of wash. That's always been the case. But I think the problem is that we often miss the inequalities that exist within those numbers. So just like I showed with the, um, the indigenous populations in Canada, when you zoom in on particular sort of hot spots uh, where services have been neglected for various um, structural reasons, where certain communities have been left behind, um, which is also why we have these SDGs of replacing the MDGs, we see that uh, there are actually much worse conditions. So I haven't been looking at the trends, but certainly there's been increasing attention, for example, informal settlements and how that's been a bit of a gap in terms of um, health that hasn't been addressed. Yeah, it's very interesting, the inter interconnections between water and sanitation and, and health, of course, and climate change. Um, any other question? I don't see any hands. So then I think we move on with our last 
presenter for this block, and that's Tarsis. Yes. So, so Tarsis is an international project lead for SMHI. So please go ahead and we'll look forward to an interesting talk. You are also replacing Jafet Andersson, who was supposed to be here, uh, but his wife is expecting their third child, so, so he couldn't be here. And we're very glad that you could be here in his place and we look forward to hear your talk. And you will talk about floods and droughts. <laughs> yes. Let okay. me thank you for inviting Jafet. <laughs> and myself here thanking Jafet. Otherwise, I would not have been here. Uh, I will be talking about floods mainly. Uh, as a bit mentioned a bit earlier, he said that are we talking about too much and too little? I think I will mainly focus on uh, too much, but touch a bit on too little. Uh, my topic is hydrological forecasting to save lives and reduce hunger. And I have to show that we have been saving lives. Uh, um, what is the problem actually have been touched on? Uh, since the morning. I, I don't have to... I, by the way, I excuse myself because I'm a French speaker, then I will be uh, a bit mixing. <laughs> um, SMHI experience, I will be talking about SMHI experience uh, from co-development co of hydrologic forecasting and ad systems uh, and uh, respective added value as life-saving or contributing to hunger alleviation. I will take three cases, uh, one from West Africa, the second from Ethiopia in East Africa, and the last one in Zimbabwe in Southern Africa. Um, um, I will emphasize that on the fact that SMI is always some uh, partnering with local uh, uh, partners because they are, they are one who knows the context. Um, just to access and update flood forecast and alerts through a robust operational hydrological forecasting system and a warning tool on flood and drought risks. That's a platform which we have been developing a lot, a lot, uh, many years. Uh, this is, you can uh, access that platform through that link, which is fanfar.au. Uh, this one is another one we have been developing in Ethiopia with Ethiopian partners. Uh, we can access it uh, through this link, which is WACA. WACA actually stands for Integrated Water Resources uh, and the Climate Information for Africa. Uh, Actually, the, if for West Africa, it was a long journey. And I have to highlight these uh, pioneers. Uh, you can see this is actually Berit, who was who were sitting there. Ah, sorry. I couldn't see. Uh, this is Berit, the one in black is I, and in the middle here is Jafet the one that he pressed, and in the back is uh, Joel. This team were uh, in West Africa in uh, 2012. If you have been in Niger, uh, you can see this bridge, uh, which is 600 meter long. And uh, we started there. Uh, and uh, it is uh, many a story, a series of projects starting in 2011, uh, with, with many financiers. Uh, the first one was SIDA and uh, the FETESCA project, uh, the European S Space Agency, and uh, the last was EU funds. Um, we have been partnering with uh, more than 30 institutions in uh, 17 countries. Um, 
mainly with uh, AgriMet, which is a regional climate center in West Africa, based in Niamey in Niger. Uh, many uh, river basins, national hydro and meteorological institutions, in, institutes, institutes, and uh, emergency managers services. Uh, it was mainly in kind of uh, joint and research and development, technical training, workshops. He, he always um, is, uh, we, um, the approach is a co-design, co-development. Uh, we sit together to see what can fit their need. Uh, this, the platform we have been, de we developed for West Africa region. Uh, <sighs> Um, you can see we have 10 days forecast uh, where um, you can see, um, you can point at uh, one point and can see what, what, what should be the, the flat level and you can uh, maybe inform the people to, um, to allo allocate or to, to go somewhere else. Uh, this the operational um, production. You can see here is the river flow. I mean the data, earth observation, uh, which are uh, which feed the hydrological models and uh, the meteorological forecasts feeding the our, our hydrological models. And then you derive the flood risk information, which is um, uh, sent to the public in different the channels. Can be uh, websites, can be SMS, can be uh, uh, whatever. It can be WhatsApp message, which is sent to the, the public, and then they can take action. I will come back to that. Uh, here is are uh, some examples. Here we are in. Uh, oh, sorry. Maybe yeah. Here we are in Marahu in uh, Ivory Coast, with uh, our partners informing that the system could uh, uh, um, highlight the, the, the information of our far is what was correct. He, with, um, along this road in uh, Mar Mar Marabue, in Evan Coast, um, Ivory Coast. Here and we are in Niger, where we have uh, 2000, um, it was 10th of August in 2020. And this was the worst flood in 100 years. Uh, the consequences with this flood was about 71 victims, 350,000 aff affected, and 1,441 uh, hectare uh, of agriculture destroyed. Uh, when you look at the information, actually, you can see uh, the, the red here is the, the observations, and the Blue and green are the model. You can see the trend is the same, but the, the difference that you can see that the, the, for the far performance, timing and severity were captured, but uh, the duration was uh, underestimated. But still, the trend was, the, was uh, correct. Uh, here we are in Nigeria. Uh, in September uh, 2020, it was also the, the worst flood event. Uh, he, um, in the morning, um, even the media was flooded. Many uh, new paper, newspapers reporting on the event. You can see the, this uh, picture is the same in different uh, newspapers. Uh, and the, as the, we like feedback, we could see uh, at the, our local partners could inform us that uh, this flood um, happened in 25 uh, states uh, out of 26 in, uh, in uh, Nigeria. 
126 deaths, 40,000, uh, almost more, more, more than 48,000 persons dis displaced, and 29, more than 29,000 houses destroyed. For these uh, floods, the information was provided by the FAFA system to the NISA, NISA, the Nigerian uh, Institute, uh, Nigerian Hydrological Services Agency. Uh, and that they, 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 they could inform the, 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 the dam managers to, inf to either to inform the, pop the population to, uh, to relocate and uh, uh, that is Jamena. Jamena is uh, Nichad. That uh, the, inf the same information was uh, picked from Fafar, given to the public, and the public could uh, take action. This the communication. When we are talk communicate with with uh, local people, we use all channels to communicate and get feedback. That was was the chat uh, WhatsApp message to know if to to to, to, to know if they are using the system, and then. Here we, we could see, unfortunately in French, we can see that they, they, they inform that they are using the fanfare, the fanfare is, is providing right information. As feedback to know, to know how the information is, uh, is accurate, uh, you can see that um, six of the informants say that the information is good. Uh, still, there are some some challenges. The system is good, however, uh, the first alerts should be minimized. Uh, problems with the lo 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 login uh, as uh, technology not as, as much as advanced, but still uh, they think that we are doing a great, great job and uh, wish we keep doing what we are doing already best. Uh, like uh, asking the uh, uh, like good of using Fafar, and then you can see that they very likely will be using the system. And uh, uh, if Fafar changes the way they are managing floods, you can see that nine of uh, uh, 13 respondents uh, were positive. Uh, that is the case of Ethiopia. Maybe I'll give you the same approach. Actually, we are uh, co-developing our systems with local partners, which are uh, the EMI, it's the uh, Ethiopian Meteorological Institute, uh, Mover, which is the, the, uh, the Ministry of Water and, and uh, Energy, and the EDRMC, which is the Ethiopian Disaster Risk Manage Management Commission. Uh, we are always co-developing our systems. Um, that is Zimbabwe, the same approach, uh, sitting together, developing our si uh, different systems, checking if the system are, are, are used, if, if the information is getting to the users, uh, downtown or abroad in the, downtown in the country, and uh, that that is the info that is the the way they were providing information to the public before and uh, that is how the information looks like today the if uh, in a metogram format that is masvingo which is uh, south west providing the maximum and the minimum that is the temperature the precipitation and the, the wine. Um, that's the, the big challenge for me. Uh, there are many initiatives going on, very, very, a, a lot of initiative going on. All these are initiatives with many fi financiers, but there is lack of collaboration, cooperation, Coordination is a still a challenge, uh, but um, I think there is a, a already a positive aspect in this because there is a rapid increase in the number of institutions uh, taking care of floods as a, a big a, a big issue. Uh, 
um, or, or, uh, but those ones are not connected. They are, there is a lack of collaboration. And uh, I think uh, I'm done. I, I wonder if you are active in the same region or country or interesting, interested in this, the, the same area of work, then please uh, you can join us or let us join you to, to make a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I think, uh, or we think we have time for maybe one question for Tassis, if we have any question from the audience. So, yeah, sir. Do you know who specifically is getting the information and who might be not getting it? Yes, they are. Uh, actually, the it is a combination of issues to make to make sure that the information they are getting to the users, the, the word users actually is broad. There are much more advanced users. There are uh, the users like my mom at the village. Uh, those who are advanced are getting information easily because they are also getting they are having. Uh, facilities to get access, but those who are uh, the, in uh, in the in the country, uh, they have, as you see, many of this information digitally. And to get this information, you have to get a mobile, which is digitally connected, and it is not given to all. Uh, the uh, the other issue is uh, uh, to know what you need. Actually, you you. You, while you need, you know you need something, but you will have to design to know what you need exactly. But it's not given that you know what you need. That's why we are sitting all the time with the potential user to know to 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 design our products, our services to what they need, and to be able to transform these in a format which which we will be used. Uh, it, it takes a lot of time. That's why we started in 20, uh, 2012, but st still now we are still on, on, working on it just to ensure that the information is, a, is in that format which will be uh, highly used. All right, thank you so much. So I think this is a wrap up for this hour. It's been very interesting. As a PhD student, I see a lot of potential for postdoc projects. So I'm scattering <laughs> around for data for everyone. It seems to be a lot. So really looking forward to discussing more with you during the break. And I'm sure you other here in the audience will also take the opportunity to talk with our speakers a bit more. Now I believe we're gonna move on to the session on food. So I invite uh, the other uh, moderators to come on stage. So, welcome to our session on food. Uh, my name is Anne-Marie Varmanson, and I'm Professor Emerita Chalmers, and I'm also active in this Academy of Sciences and part of the organization committee. And as, as a co-chair, I have Richard Landberg, and maybe you can say something about yourself. Yeah, I'm also from Chalmers University of Technology, and I'm a professor in food and health, and I'm also leading the Division of Food and Nutrition Science at Chalmers. <coughs> it's very nice to be here today. And then we have Eleanor. Uh, Hallström, who will talk later on, and she is associate professor and senior scientist at RISE, and she is responsible for coordinating the research on sustainable nutrition, but you will hear more from her later on. I just want to connect to what Maria ended this morning and give you some words about food security and nutrition in the world before we go into more details about this. And I would like to start with the uh, sustainable, sustainable Development Goals because what we have heard today is, I mean, they are very important because they have enabled us to me measure and have indicators for the development within all these Sustainable Goals. And I think we have seen a number of examples of that. 
And when it comes to food, um, it's very interesting to read uh, the FIO report because they report every year about uh, food security and nutrition in the world. And every year they have a different theme, so you can follow. Uh, for example, in 2021, there was a lot of information about affordable nutrition food. It's not, I mean, people, uh, 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 nutrition sec secure food costs five times more than a, a calorie sufficient food. So how can people afford to buy uh, the right food? That was part of 20, 2021, 2020, I think, something wrong here. Uh, and, and then food and agriculture, that's very much related to what we talk about today, the effect of climate and agriculture on food and health. 2022, it was interesting because it was about the, the responsibility of the politicians. How does legislation and sub subsidiaries influence uh, the, the affordability of food? Maybe we should have more subsidiary to nutritious food, like food and uh, fruit and vegetable, vegetables, and not only wheat, rice, and maize, which are now getting the most subsidiaries. And last this year, it was very much about uh, um, urbanization and the effects of urbanization, which we also touched upon in, in many presentations. So. Um, uh, the latest report on, on sustainable development goal two, zero hunger, is not so good, really. Uh, around 10% of the world faced hunger in 2022. And the perspective for 2030 is that almost 600 million people will be chronically undernourished in 2030. Today, 30% of the global population were moderate, moderately or severely food insecure in 2022. And more than 3 billion people could not afford a healthy diet. So these were the key messages uh, for this year. And um, it's interesting to see how you can measure. Uh, if you look at the prevalence of undernourishment, we can see that uh, this is a, a percentage, and here you have in numbers, that the, the undernourishment went down steadily until this point when we had the pandemic, and then it started to rise, and then we had the war in Ukraine, and it started to rise. And which was not here, we have, it has leveled out a little bit. And, we can see, we can divide that into uh, continent by continents. And that, then we can also make, I'm, I'm going to show you the what happened in the world here. This was the, what, what was uh, proposed uh, before the pandemic. And then uh, the decline in undernourishment went, went down much more than here, when we had uh, the pandemic started, and then we had the war in Ukraine. So you can measure for different types of events. You can see what is going to happen. And you can divide it then into continents. So this is for Africa, not so good at all. And Asia will recover much more. And then you can divide it further on into countries by countries. So, and we, when, we, when we come to the distribution of food insecurity, uh, around 30% of the world are food insecure today. And then you can divide it to, to, to continent by continent. In our part of the world, it looks very small. It's around 8%, but it, it's increasing a little bit. So um, uh, that is also something we will hear more about during these next presentations. One indicator that most of you know quite a lot about is to reduce waste. If 
but waste is different in different parts of the world. Um, oh, sorry. So, in the develop in in our parts of the world, um, most of the waste is come from consumption, not so much from production. Uh, but when we go to, to, to developing countries, the losses are much more uh, uh, higher in, in, the, in the handling and the production. So, um, uh, and, and this, this slide is from um, 2009, so it's quite old. And I would be interested to see what is happening today when we have, for example, lots of our crops stored in harbors in Ukraine, for example. And that would probably change the graphs quite a lot. Um, so that's an important indicator. When we come to climate action and good health and well-being, one, one has done a lot of work to, to see what, how different dyes are uh, influencing greenhouse gases uh, emissions. And here we have five diets. This is the sort of present typical American diet, I would say. And you can see the, the effects of different types of, of foods, uh, dairy foods, meat, uh, cereals, etc. So we have quite a big impact from this diet. If you go to a flex, flexitarian diet where you eat, you still eat meat, but not so much, you get uh, quite a big decrease, and then it goes down to the vegan diet. I think we will hear much more about this in, in by the speakers to come here. So, um, and you can see from different countries, and you can see from different women and men, etc., how the diet is is affecting greenhouse gas emissions. But that those data are mostly from agriculture. I would say. The diet, we have seen already today this graph about the effect of the global burden of death when it comes to risk factors. And this is a rather new study from 2009, about 204 countries have been, data being collected from 204 countries, and, and the dietary risks come second also in this recent work. Uh, so it really shows that uh, the diet is quite important. And I think it's time to go to the next speaker now. And I would like to introduce Eleanor Hallstrom. And I think she you will continue a little bit with the messages I gave. Thank you. Um, we'll take the question after all speakers. So. Hello everyone. Uh, in this presentation, we will talk about environmental and health effects of our food system. We will talk about critical trends and challenges, but also potential solutions. And we will discuss some co-benefits and trade-offs between health and environmental goals. But let us start by looking at the big picture of our food system, where we have some large challenges, both from environmental and health perspectives. Our global food system is identified as a major source of environmental pressure, estimated to account for about one third of the global greenhouse gas emissions, but also for a large share of our use of natural resources, such as land and water. And from a health perspective, we have this two side challenge where about 10% of the global population, that's about 8 million people that had not inadequate access of food and water. At the same time, we have about 40% of the population suffering from overweight and obesity. So this means that about half of the global population lives on an unbalanced diet. So there are several 
trends that are closely connected to our current but also future food system. And one of them is the global population. We are today 1.8 billion people in the world, and this number is expected to increase to 9 or perhaps even 10 billion by the mid-century. And of course, this will put an increasing pressure on our food system. But in addition to this, our diet habits are also changing, especially in the emerging countries where most of this population growth is expected to take place. Um, and this is the second trend I'd like to mention, sometimes referred to as the nutrition transition. So the trend is that when we get wealthier, we tend to eat more, increase our daily calorie intake, but also change our preferences towards foods that are more resource demanding, such as a greater share coming from animal-based foods, but also more processed foods and empty calories. So not only do we need to feed a larger population in the future, with the current trends, the diets of these people will also be more resource demanding and have a higher environmental impact. And of course, these dietary changes will also have important implications for our health. Another challenge or perhaps reality that we need to consider is the ecological and physical limitations of our planet. And this year, the um, human impact on the planetary <coughs> boundaries were reassessed for the third time, showing that six out of the nine planetary boundaries that are defined were transgressed, and that the pressure on all of these boundary processes are increasing. And all of these six boundaries that were found to be crossed are very highly related to our food system. So in my research, I have studied the <coughs> environmental impact of self-reported diets and its relation to the planetary boundaries. And this picture shows results from a recent study where the red line shown here is the estimated planetary boundaries for the food system downscaled to a per capita level. This is, of course, really tricky to estimate. So the pink areas around here show the uncertainty ranges estimated for these planetary boundaries. The black mark on the yellow bars here are the results from this study showing the environmental impact, the mean environmental impact, from the diet in this Swedish population that we studied. And the bottom and top, bottom and top of the yellow bars show the impact from the subgroups with the lowest and highest impact. So what this really shows was that the mean environmental impact of the diet in this Swedish population was exceeding the planetary boundaries for all the environmental indicators studied, except for the fresh water use. And most critical was the situation for extinction rate and nitrogen applications, where the boundaries were exceeded by more than fourfold. So what can we then do to reduce the environmental impact of our food system? Well, very simply put, we really have three main components to work with. The environmental impact of our food system is depending on what and how much we eat. In other words, how sustainable our consumption is, and how large the impact is from the food that we eat. So how sustainable the production is. And the third factor that matters here, which was already mentioned, is the share of food that is lost and wasted along the food chain. And here we really have a tremendous opportunity for improvement since about one third of the global food production is estimated to be lost or wasted prior to consumption currently. So international authorities like the WHO and the IPCC, they claim that diet change is a key strategy forward necessary to reach um, a more sustainable food system. And diet change really hold a great potential 
Research shows that adoption of more sustainable diets can reduce um, the environmental impact by half, or perhaps even more when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, and at the same time improve the health effects of our diet. So this is why diet change is believed to be a key strategy forward uh, for reducing our environmental impact and improve health especially in the high and income high and middle income countries so to better understand what a more sustainable diet thing could look like let's first have a look at the current environmental impact and health effects from our diet this picture shows the contribution to environmental impact per food category in the same Swedish population that we saw before. And in line with previous research, our results showed that animal-based foods, mainly driven by consumption of red meat and dairy products, um, accounted for a large proportion of the diet's total environmental impact. Especially when it comes to nitrogen application, greenhouse, uh, greenhouse <coughs> gas emissions, and cropland use. That's the three left bars to the left, three bars to the left. But consumption of plant-based foods and discretionary foods also had a quite substantial impact, especially when it came to extinction rate and consumptive water use. And something that I thought was really interesting in these results was that the impact from discretionary foods, that's consumption of snacks and sweets, but also alcoholic beverages and tea and coffee, foods that we do, do not really need from a nutritional point of view, contributed 9 to 37% of the diet's total environmental impact across these six environmental indicators. And I think this is quite important to highlight, actually, because research on sustainable diets, but also policy initiatives, and dietary recommendations for more sustainable diets, they tend to have a main focus on core foods of the diet and sometimes forget the role of these discretionary foods and beverages. So we heard that diet is an important risk factor uh, for illness and premature death. And here you can see the top 10 dietary risk factors for premature death in Sweden and globally. So what you can see here is that most of these dietary risk factors are connected to a too low intake of healthy plant-based foods and a too high intake of sodium and red and processed meat. Research shows that there are several positive synergies between the recommendations mm -hmm. for a more healthy diet and a diet that is lower in environmental impact. And in affluent mm -hmm. countries like Sweden, important co-benefits are the recommendations for a balanced energy intake, a diet predominantly consisting of healthy plant-based foods, and a restricted intake in nutrient-poor foods. And there are several healthy characteristics that often can be seen in diets with lower environmental impact, such as a lower energy intake, higher intake of whole grains and fiber, a healthier fat quality with less saturated fat, a lower intake of red and processed meat, but also less alcohol and salt. And as you remember from the previous slide, with the dietary risk factors that matters most, you find mo many of them here. So these are dietary factors that are believed to have a great potential to improve our health. But there are also potential trade-offs that we need to consider. In fact, uh, research on self-reported diets have shown that Diets with a lower environmental impact often have higher intake of sugary foods. And in addition, low intake of fruits and vegetables, nuts and seafoods, are often observed in self-reported diets with uh, lower environmental impact, especially if 
the assessments are considering a wide environmental perspective. Low environmental impact food, um, diets may also be lower in micronutrients and have a lower bioavailability of some nutrients. And this is something that Richard is, I think, going to talk more about in his presentation. So we have quite good evidence or good evidence for the need to limit animal-based foods in a more sustainable diet. But to have also um, benefits for the health, we need to remember to also consider the uh, urgency of having or forwarding um, policy initiatives to keep energy balance uh, and to restrict the intake of foods with low nutritional value. We should promote intake of vegetables, fruits, legumes, and other healthy plant-based foods to a recommended level. But to do this within the planetary boundaries, we may have to consider targeted advice on the selection also within plant-based foods. For win-win solutions, we need to ensure that sustainable diets um, have an adequate nutrient intake. And for this, we may have to consider special risk nutrients, but also risk groups of the population with special requirements. So now we're talking about the children, the adolescents, the fertile women and pregnant women, and the elderly <coughs> in particular. And I also would emphasize the uh, importance of uh, considering in research um, more focus on assessments of nutrient status and also the effects of bioavailability. So to sum up here, um, our food system have major challenges, both in terms of environmental and health perspectives. And for a more sustainable food system, we need changes both in production and consumption of food. Sustainable diets hold a great potential, both to improve human health and planetary health. In the discussion of sustainable diets, we should remember to consider the total diet and not only the core foods. And I think that um, this presentation, but also this whole symposium of today really emphasizes the importance of interdisciplinary research, including a wide sustainability perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eleanor. I think there will be probably a lot of questions that we will save for afterwards. But I think Richard will continue yes. with this message. Thank you. Okay, I think I will take on where you ended and try to make this a little bit into a more Nordic context because you gave now very nicely the global context of the food system and the health and sustainability issues and I would try to nail it down to a more uh, to the Nordic context here. But first starting again, as you said very clearly that uh, the food system is uh, really a major challenge in the climate uh, uh, challenges that we have. I mean, it stands for one third of the carbon dioxide emissions. It uh, occupies a lot of the land use uh, and also the use of fresh water that we have uh, globally. We also see that non-communicable diseases in parallel with this is the major cause of death and also in, in morbidities that, that leads to death in cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, cancers, and, and, and so on. So these are major challenges, but they are very much interconnected. And again, just highlighting this from the Global Burden of Disease report, as you can see that uh, dietary risks comes really at the top among risks for non-communicable diseases. And this is the same not only globally, but also in the Nordic countries. So uh, it translates really that we have too little of whole grains, we have too little of fruits and nuts and vegetables, and we have too much of red meat, processed meat, 
uh, salt and, and so on. So this is very much in line with what we pretty much know already from before. When we look into this in the Nordic context, this was what I mentioned as well, um, the situation looks basically the same. It's just a, a little bit of a flipped uh, order among those, but we see very clearly that low whole grain intake, and who would believe that a low whole grain intake would have such a big uh, impact on risk of developing cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes, for instance. But this is what comes out from, from this analysis. And that's very much in line with large-scale meta-analysis and so on, looking into the role of how we consume carbohydrates and that quality of carbohydrates, whether we consume it as refined grains or whole grain, has really a big impact. And they tend to be reciprocal. So if you eat a lot of whole grain, you eat less of refined grains. So this is a exchange effect that we see very much uh, here. We also see that in, in the Nordic countries, obesity is a major problem. So almost one half of the adult population is overweight or obese. And this is, of course, fueling the, uh, the uh, incidences of uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And it has been estimated that around 30 to 50 percent of of an alteration towards a healthier diet as part of a healthier lifestyle could prevent cardiovascular disease and almost one third of, of the cancers could be preventable <coughs> by changing towards a healthier diet and lifestyle. What about the dietary habits? Uh, I think that Anne-Marie showed that on a global level uh, in a more long-term perspective, but this was a survey that was conducted by the uh, National Public Health uh, uh, Institute in Sweden recently. And what you can see here, even if it's written in Swedish, is that uh, from 2016 and to, up to 2022, the consumption of fruit and <coughs> vegetables and fruits, uh, not fruits, but, uh, but uh, root, <laughs> fruits and vegetables goes down, shellfish and fish goes down, and sugar-sweetened beverages goes up. So this is a trend that is, of course, not uh, very positive. And you can see the frequencies of consumption here um, in this table. So uh, it seems to go a little bit in the wrong direction, at least uh, very recently. When we look into the Nordic context, Anne-Marie showed this on the global context, but the picture is the same when it comes to how does different food groups, how do different food groups con contribute to the, to the uh, climate impact? And this is the, on the carbon dioxide emissions. And you can see very clearly from these figures from the Nordic countries that it is actually dairy. Animal-based products uh, are standing for the majority of uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions, whereas staple foods such as cereals and, and fruits and vegetables and so on uh, is, is much less. So it's quite clear what we need to change also from this uh, perspective. But I think it's important also to consider and think a little bit about what does it mean when we talk about sustainable diets in this context. This is one definition that has been used, and it refers to uh, many different aspects that you can see. It's uh, those diets with low environmental impacts, uh, which contribute to food and nutrition security and to healthy life for present and future generations. Sustainable diets are protective and respectful of biodiversity and ecosystems, culturally acceptable, accessible, economically fair and affordable, nutritional adequate, safe, healthy, while optimizing natural and human resources. Neutral, uh, natural and human resources. So there are very many aspects uh, brought into this concept of sustainability. And although uh, for most cases what is measured is greenhouse uh, emissions that, and land use. These are the parameters that are taken into account typically when we talk about sustainability. But as you can see, the issue is much more complex. The problem is that we don't have good tools and indicators to incorporate these aspects to the same, um, to the same degree, which we probably should. And there are a lot of goal conflicts here in, already in this definition, as you can see. But there are also guidance. Uh, so this was a guidance uh, report from, uh, about sustainable healthy diets from the WHO, um, uh, pointing out principles that we should consider when, when trying to reach towards sustainable diets. So 
um, they have um, developed for a pathway so you can have a look into uh, different aspects that they think we should consider in order to reach these uh, uh, sustainable and healthy uh, diets. So I, I would recommend you to have a look into this report. There have also been Nordic efforts, so the Stockholm Resilience Center together with others uh, had a nice report in 2019 in connection with the Eat Lancet report when that was launched. They, they did a separate report on how that can be translated basically into Nordic conditions. And they pointed out very clearly that well, for transformation of the food system in the Nordic perspective, we need to assess first of all the Nordic food system. How does the whole system look like? We need to define what are the op safe operating spaces. We know the planetary boundaries, but how does this translate into our Nordic context? And then we need to compare different uh, ways of producing foods, different types of food production system. And then not the least, uh, we need to act in order to transform these uh, food systems. So basically policies uh, and, and how, to, how to make the change. Uh, what this boils down very much into, <coughs> in practical terms, is uh, along the lines with the Nordic nutrition recommendations. And you know, the Nordic nutrition recommendations were updated this summer. But this is a picture of the old ones, but in this broad and overall general picture, it is the same as the previous one. So basically what it say is, again, increase vegetables, and now they emphasized even more pulses uh, in this uh, version of the Nordic rec Nutrition Recommendations. Increase fruit and berries, fish and seafood, sustainable produced uh, uh, fish and seafood, nuts and seeds. And then we should have a number of ref um, exchanges also. So when we consume cereals, for instance, we should do it in, 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 in whole grains rather than refined grains. When we have our fat, it should be as vegetable oils and, and uh, spreads rather than, than butter. Um, and we should go from high fat dairy into low fat dairy. And we should limit uh, for, for red and processed meat and beverages, sugar sweetened beverages and salt and, and alcohol. And this is again, very much in line to what uh, most people already know. Um, I can mention that we have started an EU project, or we are partners in a large EU project together with RISE. And um, as part of this, the whole EU project is about to change, to, to make, make actions, uh, missions, to, to change the food system towards a more healthier and sustainable food consumption. And part of this uh, EU project, uh, we got the task to establish uh, switch hubs, they call it. So six different hubs across Europe where we gather uh, multi-sectorial uh, actors. So we get, gather different actors, industry, policymakers, universities, and so on, to try to come up with and define missions and try to de define uh, very concrete actions on how, to, how we can make this change. And in this uh, food hub that we just inaugurated in, in the west part of Sweden, so we start from there, we have decided that we will work for uh, basically these actions, which are very much in line with what you, what you saw on the, on the previous slide pointed out by others, how we can do to increase uh, the green food intakes so of vegetables, legumes, whole grains on the plate, how we can increase sustainable seafood consumption, how we can decrease meat and also salt, and also uh, um, decrease uh, candy and, and, and so on. And this we would expect, I mean, and this is very well substantiated, will have an uh, impact on health, but also on, on climate, as I uh, mentioned before. How can we translate this? Very often, it's, there are very unclear goals set. I mean, politicians cannot make very concrete goals because then they are always getting upset by, by someone. Uh, but we can do it as scientists. So what we have done, we have tried in this uh, food hub to put up very concrete numbers on what we need to achieve uh, with regards to the change when it comes to vegetable intake, legume intake, whole grain intake, red meat, seafood, added sugar, and so on. So we have set up something that we call the target diet, which is the switch diet which is basically starting off from the updated Nordic nutrition recommendations because we are so fortunate that the Nordic nutrition recommendations takes both, uh, both uh, sustainability and health into account. And that's not everywhere in the world what, where that happens. But it has also been tuned a little bit to fit also other European countries. But this is mainly reflecting the Nordic nutrition recommendations. And you can see this is the target and this is what uh, we have today. So 
In some aspects, we have to do a lot. So for vegetables and, and legumes, we have to speed up and make quite substantial changes. And how can we do that? Of course, we need then to have producers of this food in, involved, because when we look into the whole grain campaign in Denmark, where the Danish populations have doubled their intake in whole grain intake, and that has been fueled by new product in the market that the consumers accept. So this is very important to have food industry on board and not against in order to, to make these changes possible. And because consumers, they show, they select what is tasty and what they think is good for them. If we look into how this transition could uh, impact, and this is just to compare uh, different sources of, of, of protein production. So if we compare how we produce protein and the environmental impact on that, comparing different uh, protein sources, you can see beef and milk, as, as pointed out before, they are really uh, contributing to land use, carbon dioxide emission, freshwater, and so on. Whereas many of the staple foods, grains and legumes and so on, they are really much lower in their contribution to the environment uh, uh, problems. Um, what, we are, what we think very much is missing in this, uh, when we talk about the green protein shift, because very much is about changing towards green, and it's very much focused in the Nordic countries on legumes, on different uh, fava beans, and, and, and so on. I think we have forgotten very much uh, the cereals in this, because cereals, on a global level, Cereals is the main source of energy in the diet worldwide. Cereals is also the main source of plant protein in the diet worldwide, because cereals contain quite a lot of proteins, actually. It's the largest source of carbohydrates and dietary fiber in the diet. And the way we consume cereals has detrimental effects on health. So as you could see on the previous slide, whether we consume whole grain has or not, has a big impact on health, actually. So I think this is, a, this is a, something that is lost a little bit in our discussions about the green transition. We are focusing mainly on legumes and other things, whereas we should probably focus more on, on cereals. When it comes to the transition, the green transition, we have a number of challenges. So basically what we want is to go from meat, but also go from soy, because soy production is not very environmental friendly and we also import soy. So we want to use uh, uh, sources uh, for the green proteins from our own country and from the Nordic region. So oats can be used. Oat is rich in, 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 uh, in proteins. We can use pea. Today we use 2% of the, of the pea production for human consumption. This can be changed. Lantmannen, for instance, has just invested in a huge uh, uh, green uh, biorefinery to try to make proteins from peas for human consumption. It's a huge multi-billion uh, crown investment. Fava bean uh, is also something that is a lot of uh, research going on, how we can increase that. But we have a number of barriers when it comes to sensory aspects, nutritional quality, and functional properties of these sources. So for instance, the protein, the properties are comparable to soy, but protein quality overall is, is lower. We also have a problem with antinutrients. So when we are enriching protein from these grains, uh, from these pulses, we are also enriching antinutritional anti compounds. So for instance, convicin and, and visin, which is found in faba bean, for instance, should be treated as allergens in, in this case. So there are a number of precautions that we have to make. We also have problems with the taste and off flavor uh, that we need to find new ways of how to, to deal with in order to make this um, accepted to a greater extent among the consumers. But we can say that the research on soy, uh, to get soy where it is today, that has been for decades, this research has more or less just started. But there are large <coughs> efforts put into it, so there are good hopes for the future. I can say we have a national research school in food science where we have around 45 PhD students. Half of them more or less are working on on, on research related to the green protein shift. So that tells something, I think, on the activities. Meat substitutes. When you say green, green transition, people think about these kind of products. And actually, this is an important category of new product. But this is perhaps not the way we should uh, make our transition, even if it's uh, 
perhaps the fast way for, for a family when they do their grocery shopping and they, they, they select something which is quite similar to what they already eat. And this is really a growing market and uh, uh, worldwide and in Sweden, even if it has staggered uh, recently. But there are problems with this type of foods. First of all, um, it is produced in, 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 through extrusion and through, so either you do extraction of the proteins with using a wet extraction and do dry fractionation, and then you have to texturize it. And that's where um, uh, uh, processing such as uh, extrusion comes in. And uh, this could be good, um, even if texture and so on is a challenge. But uh, what happens with the nutrients for, for in this uh, type of processes? And this is really a problem in, 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 in this area. So a green protein shift can be really healthy. We can have benefit on lowering risk of cardiovascular disease and, and uh, type 2 diabetes and so on. But we should also consider that uh, when going from more bioavailable sources of iron and so on, like in the meat, uh, uh, we have challenges with, with iron and also other nutrients when we make this transition towards the green. So we have to watch out for, for a B12 and uh, an iron and zinc uh, bioavailability, particularly because many foods are rich in iron, but it's really not bioavailable, vitamin D and, and so on, and particularly for vulnerable groups. It's so easy just to talk about the health benefits for, for some, mainly middle-aged men, perhaps, <laughs> and forget about these other groups in, in this transition. And who is really adopting healthy plant-based diet? It's typically young women who are forerunners in, in this type of transition. And perhaps they are not the ones who should do that. Since many, every third woman in, young woman in Sweden have iron deficiency, according to some definitions. So we have to be a little bit precautious in this. Mm -hmm. So these are really the nutritional challenges as we see in this transition. So on a macronutrient level, we have lower protein content, particularly in dairy analog products and also in some of these meat analogs, as I just showed. We have um, issues with protein digestibility and also with the bioavailability. There are some shortages for some essential amino acids, but mainly it's on the micronutrients where we have problems with iron uh, bioavailability, zinc bioavailability, um, accessibility of B12 and, and so on. And then we have the antinutrients, which we have to take care of. There are ways of doing that, but still, particularly in this highly processed uh, uh, meat analog products and so on, there are very high levels of these um, antinutrients that, that uh, hinders uh, uh, bioavailability, for instance, of, of the minerals. What do the consumers say uh, about this? 51% of the European meat consumers report reducing their annual uh, meat in intake, um, up from 46% in 21. So there is a shift in, in consumption, at least uh, what they tell themselves. And these are the main motivators to reduce meat intake. It's really health across the different countries. It is animal welfare and it is the environment in that order. And I think this is interesting to see that health is rated so high. And this is a big survey. You can click on, the, on this. It's a very nice survey by a large EU project called Smart Protein Project. <laughs> can also see the consumer's view where they would like to consume plant-based alternatives. And that is typically at home, so it's not at restaurants. There they want to have the classical food that they eat. And they see the barriers is that it's too expensive, it's not tasty enough, and they need more information about the sources. So it's really uh, taste, uh, price also is important, and, and, uh, and the... the the uh, taste, and taste and price, these are the major uh, barriers for consumption of, of uh, plant-based. So we need a transition towards healthier and more sustainable diets. That's for sure globally and also in the Nordic context. We need to increase plant-based foods for sure and, and on the expense of, of red meat. But we have to do that very precautious and not just run into it. Um, when it comes really to the protein, the green protein shift again, uh, balance the health benefits with potential risks among different groups. And we should focus more on nutrition. I mean, it has been very much focused on producing and making these type of analogs available and so on, but what is the nutritional value and how can we increase that in, in these type of products? Taste, health, and price, these are the key drivers among the consumers. And with that, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Rita. And now we are all of us are ready for your questions. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for some really lovely talks. Really um, I'm quite interested in kind of the practicalities of this. Like, if we're trying to transition to this kind of sustainable, healthy diet, I find um, if you talk to most people, they will want to have a sustainable, healthy diet, but we're really bad decision makers on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. Mm. And we also don't like to be told what to do. Um, so it kind of... Are you trying to make sure there are alternatives available and persuade people to buy them? Or are you talking about kind of removing the unhealthy alternatives and kind of restricting choice? Like, how does this practically work? We could comment on that. Do you want to start? <clears throat> yeah, well, I can start. Um, so we know that, well, perhaps this is the target, but we know that it's really hard to change dietary habits on an individual level and even more so on a systemic level. Um, what we shall chose is that, of course, our dietary choices are dependent on a number, a very big number of different factors in our daily lives. Taste, price, supply, just to mention a few. Uh, and what perhaps is emphasized now in the terms of how to change dietary habits, because we know most of these recommendations have been the same for a long time, but still some of the developments are even going in the wrong direction. So how do we get there? Well, some say that we, what is needed is an environment that supports this. So this means that we have different actors in the food chain at different levels that need to collaborate and also work towards the same goal because that is not really happening today. So perhaps that's one, one answer. No, I, I, I would allude a little bit into that. I think definitely from food industry, they have to make tastier food products that the consumer wants. I mean, that was very nicely shown by this 10 year uh, public private partnership going on in Denmark, trying to shift towards more whole grain consumption, for instance. It's really a success factor to, that they really invest a lot. So they had when they started like 100 products on the shelves, now it's 600 or something. Mm -hmm. So that, that has driven a lot. But I think it's also policies. I mean, it is possible to put a, a sugar tax in Mexico. Why shouldn't that be possible here? It's political will when it comes to that. And it's also finding, we have something in the, in the Nordic countries and particularly in Sweden, perhaps also in Finland, which other countries don't have. We have an enormous public sector serving foods in different, all the way from kindergarten to schools to elderly homes and so on. That's a fantastic opportunity to introduce uh, new ways of consuming foods and, and basically teach, uh, teach the society and, and, and be forerunners when it comes to uh, introducing new concepts and so on, testing and so on. So I think that, of course, we need to do change the environment, but every actor also have to take their part in it. So Yeah, I would say that's part of the food environment, yeah, yeah. that it's very important. That's true. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentations. Um, I'm coming back to the um, uh, with the producers and the industry. Mm -hmm. um, Early this year, there was a series published in the Lancet about commercial determinants of health. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the food and agriculture industry is a big part of that. Yeah. And I was also, you mentioned, Rickard, uh, that the, in your EU, EU project uh, had also the industry. Uh, we know that there is an enormous power of the, uh, from the industry. And it's not uh, perhaps so easy to uh, uh, withstand that energy also for the pu in the public in a way. So I'm just curious about how you deal with the, uh, the industry uh, and their goals versus also your goals. Sometimes they're aligned, but I mean, ones want to make a lot of money and the other ones not really. Yeah, you can, you can say. One thing is that you can, you can really uh, work on labeling so you can labeling the food to, to, to sort of remove <coughs> sugar or salt or so. I think in some countries they have warning warning labels, for example, when it's too much sugar, as you have on cigarettes and alcohol, you can have that on food as well. But there is another thing that the food industry, when it comes to plant food, for example, they have enormous challenges to make this plant food into, into into acceptable food products. So we forget about their challenges as well. Uh, I mean, 
when 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 we talk about for example wheat, uh, uh, wheat we can take wheat. You make pasta or something like that. You have the same wheat every day. Uh, you can produce it in big numbers. You can produce cheap products. When you get other sources, you you it, they behave differently in the processes. So you you have to have more flexible manufacture. So the industry also faces great challenges here. I think it's also a selection of picking the the arenas. I mean, as a scientist, pick the pick the, pick at least if it's possible the win wins, basically, and start to work on this. The most low hanging fruits which are win-wins, basically. And I think industry is very interested to get rid of... I mean, now the big threat for, for the green transition from an industrial point of view is really the perception of consumers that this is highly processed foods, this is a lot of ingredients on the labels and so on. And we also don't want that. We want simple food ingredient lists based on more like traditional ingredients and so on. And if we can work for that and try to, to get that in, I. I think that that is one area where there is a win-win. So I would start with the don't start with the biggest conflict uh, issues. I mean, as a starting point, see, be pragmatic. That that I think uh, we can do. We should not go against what what we think as a scientist we we have to do, but start at least where there are possibilities to collaborate, and there are great opportunities. They have. Um, they have earned a lot of money on the whole grain transition, for instance, in the Nordic countries. They they take more price for for these kind of products, and and it's a win-win. I mean, the public health will win from that transition as well. So, so I would try to start with those, and there are many. Uh, I was just wondering. They take more money for these products. Aren't you then risking creating um, further division within society where you have a healthy middle class and an unhealthy yeah. working class? Because we, the people in this room are educated. Yes. <laughs> we can afford, we're well paid. If, if these things cost more money, then, then we're going to create a two-stream society. This is true. But if you compare a whole grain pasta versus a refined grain pasta, perhaps it's two crowns more per kilo, but of course if you start to talk about meat, meat analogs, I mean that's a very pricey product. And this is what I mean, uh, perhaps we can, if we can manage to change the, the refined grain pasta to whole grain pasta to a smaller increase in cost, that's perhaps not so dangerous, but, uh, and also try to get rid of these other types of, of products, uh, I mean more ultra processed uh, products and so on. So I, I, I think there are, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a complex issue, but definitely we, we know that. I mean, the dietary changes are getting worse among the low socioeconomic groups and, and better. In Gothenburg, we have 12 years difference in life expectancy if you look into different areas of the town. So, so the, and, and that's very much uh, driven by lifestyle and diet and so on. So on I think this is a very valid point. Uh, maybe you should, they should try to make the cheap food healthier. The craft food yeah, should be healthier yeah. so people could buy it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, this is really important because we know very well that, as Richard pointed out, that the socioeconomic differences are really the health status mm. caused by diet or different, in different groups of socioeconomic groups. But I think also what, I mean, what the highlighted foods here, many of those foods that we are eating too little of uh, and that would really promote our health, not all of them are very expensive so we have the whole grain mm. products we have pulses we have fruits and vegetables so it's also perhaps possible mm. to eat those without uh, a very much higher price in, in money and we also know that i think it's 40 percent of the food budget that goes into food that are these discretionary mm. foods so <laughs> we have perhaps also an opportunity to to um, be better uh, off but there is more like uh, how can we promote this kind of food? How can we make it fancy and yeah. attractive for for consumers and and so on? I mean yeah. that that is really the challenge. I mean already for school children and so on. Yeah, yeah sorry, I, I ignored you. <laughs> yes, it's <Okay>. you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, thanks for very nice talks. Uh, so I was just wondering about dairy because I think uh, Illinois you showed that the main difference between vegan and vegetarian. Uh, food for climate impact was 
basically dairy. Okay. But I don't think that you showed it in your table of how we should change our... <laughs> dairy products is not subjected to a large change according to the Nordic nutrition recommendations. Mm -hmm. And this is partly because dairy is a source, a great source of many mm -hmm. nutrients. So, and this is also what the dairy industry is so upset about when comparing plant-based analogs they think i mean per, if you if you compare it per per nutrient i mean it's a different story than comparing per liter i mean the the plant-based is so much less dense in nutrients compared to a real uh, traditional milk so mm -hmm. it depends a little bit how you compare it but obviously dairy is a very uh, big uh, source of environmental footprint mm -hmm. so that's for sure so then it's about taking everything into yeah, account yeah it is it is mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's also a very interlinked question because, I mean, in lots of the meat that we eat, the red meat is also coming from a combined system producing both sure. dairy and meat. So it's a complex uh, question, but I mean, the most synergies, I guess, between the health and environmental uh, perspectives, that's with the reduced consumption of red meat and processed meat, mm -hmm. uh, where we have most of the negative health effects, which are not seen as much uh, in the dairy products from a health perspective then. Okay, a last question. Yes. I have a question. <clears throat> we are talking a lot about transitioning to a healthier diet, but my <clears throat> also question is that we have not talked about is about local consumption and also where these sources come from, because we can switch from a nice uh, increase our <coughs> uh, fruit consumption, but all the fruits come from South America and none from European or from Sweden. So mm -hmm. I think this is also a main source of CO2 emissions, like the transportation of food uh, industry. Uh, so what do you think about that? Yeah, some, some, in some cases, I think it's overstated. And I think a consumer might think that just because it's locally produced, it's much more sustainable environmentally and so on. Perhaps it's not because production system is not uh, uh, efficient uh, and so on. So I think we have to leave behind a little bit of our domestic policies and <laughs> and uh, uh, in that sense and be more pragmatic to really go for what is really the sustainable from a scientific analysis and so on. But there are many different dimensions here when talking about sustainability. So, of course, it's also to, to foster local uh, uh, culture and so on. So, so it's really a, a, a difficult uh, balance to make. I, you are working on this more than Yeah, so from a life cycle perspective, I mean, the role of the transport is often quite small in terms of the whole food chain when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, for example. But you have a very important point with the local... Um, perspective that it can add to the circularity of nutrients, for example. And when it comes to other environmental effects, like that we saw, for example, the fresh water use, uh, water scarcity, we are uh, where we have a higher impact from some fresh fruits, for example. So we need to consider <laughs> these local and imported, um, well, the, the um, the trade flows, where we are buying our food from, because a lot of the impact of the food that we eat here, of course, have impact in other parts of the world. So I think it's an important point still. But that is also another thing we haven't touched upon, and that is safety and risk assessment, because you have to have some traceability when, when, when you're, you, you get ingredients from all parts of the world, and that's another story, I would say, a yeah. challenging story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perhaps we can also say that this has become a much greater focus, both yeah. in research and in policy in Sweden, uh, after uh, the war, for example, where food security aspects have been discussed much more. Okay, time is uh, three o'clock, and I think it's uh, time for is a coffee break now, yes. right? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for asking me to, to speak, and I apologize for not being with you in person, uh, but hopefully we can uh, engage during the question and answer session. So what I want to focus on is one aspect of the climate and health agenda, uh, namely uh, the health care benefits of climate action. And so what I'm going to do is to focus particularly on the imperative for mitigation action, that is cutting greenhouse gas emissions, and the benefits that result from that but also, of course, acknowledge the importance of adaptation because we have to adapt as well uh, because we're already at 1.2 degrees um, and there are various manifestations that I think you've probably already heard about 
of the impacts of climate change on human health. So we have to adapt to those as best we can, but adaptation will have limits. And so we also need to cut emissions rapidly. And in doing so, of course, we can also benefit our health, not just in terms of reducing the risk of dangerous climate change, but also uh, because there are near-term co-benefits, which I will talk about. So you can see these two broad types of climate action, both of which, as I say, are imperative to try to protect uh, as far as we can uh, and um, improve uh, human health where possible. And what's important, I think, is to increasingly integrate these types of actions because they've often been considered very separately. So the adaptation community is focused on issues like disaster management, flood protection, early warning systems for heat and infectious diseases and so on. And these are all important. And the mitigation community uh, focuses on reducing emissions. And increasingly, we need to integrate these policies to avoid unnecessary trade-offs. For example, if you just put air conditioning everywhere, that will reduce, of course, indoor temperatures, but will also increase the demand for energy. And if that's generated through fossil fuels, then obviously it will increase air pollution. And of course, you have to pump the heat somewhere. So if you pump it outdoors, it increases the urban heat island effect. So integrated action is really important. But my focus then will be on mitigation actions to reduce the emissions that cause climate change, particularly carbon dioxide, but also methane and other short-lived uh, climate pollutants. And mitigation requires action across energy, of course, because about 70-80% of the emissions are coming from the burning um, of fossil fuels for, for energy, directly or indirectly, and other, um, other uses as well. And then the food system is obviously also a major contributor, depending on exactly where you put the boundaries to that. Some estimates have suggested 30% uh, of emissions. So actions in both these uh, spheres are really important to cut greenhouse gas emissions. It's important also that um, emission reductions are uh, done in an equitable way, because as we know, there are massive um, inequities in, in inequalities in emissions. And so we need to make sure that co-benefits delivered by climate mitigation are accessible to all. And this analysis suggests that the top 1% of emitters globally are responsible for about 17% of, um, uh, of carbon dioxide emissions, something of that order. It's, of course, there are other greenhouse gases as well, but that's the most important. And nearly 50% from the top 10% of emitters. So we have to address these inequalities in emissions uh, when considering how to rapidly move towards a net zero emission economy. And the drive for improved air quality could be one of the factors that helps to accelerate progress towards um, this net zero tipping point, if we can call it that. And as I think you'll be aware, the WHO air quality guideline levels are lower than they were 15 years ago. And that's because we increasingly recognize the impacts of low levels of air pollution on human health. And that evidence wasn't so clear 15 years ago when the old uh, guidelines were, were agreed. And now, as you can see, the guidelines have come down substantially. The orange are the 2005, and the green are the 2021 long-term air quality guideline levels. So you can see, for example, for PM 2.5, it's now five micrograms <coughs> per, per cubic meter. Um, and for nitrogen dioxide, it's 10 micrograms per cubic meter. So um, you can see that this really drives home the lesson that in reducing air pollution, uh, we improve human health, and that policies to reduce air pollution by um, reducing the combustion of fossil fuels and other sources of greenhouse gas emissions can have this double benefit for climate uh, and for <coughs> human health. If we just stop, if, if we just put filters on things, if we just actually um, take out some of the harmful air pollutants without addressing the carbon dioxide emissions, that can actually accelerate heating because sulfate aerosols, for example, are cooling. So if you remove them from the atmosphere, uh, yes, that may be a good thing from the pollution point of view, but it increases the um, heating. So um, how many deaths a year are, are caused by fossil fuel burning? Well, there are a whole range of different estimates. This is one that we did a few years ago, suggesting um, 3.6 million deaths based on 2015 data annually. This is from ambient air pollution related to fossil fuel burning. And the map shows you where those deaths um, occur the most. And you can see the many of them in India, uh, China, uh, other parts of Southeast Asia, but also Europe, Eastern Europe, but also North America as well. 
less so in Latin America and Africa because they don't burn so many fossil fuels. But of course, if they then start to move towards a high fossil fuel burning uh, uh, future in terms of their economy, then those air pollution deaths uh, will increase um, inevitably. And in those countries which don't burn a lot of fossil fuels, obviously household air pollution is an important contributor, as indeed it is still in India and to some extent in China as well, although it's going down. Um, so I've mentioned that carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas. It's a long acting gas, stays up in the atmosphere for 100 years or more. We don't know how to get it out of the atmosphere rapidly and economically. But it's not the only greenhouse gas. Methane is 86 times more powerful than carbon dioxide um, over a 20-year period. Um, and although methane itself is not damaging to health, it is a precursor of tropospheric ozone air pollution, which some estimates have suggested could cause perhaps a million or more premature deaths annually. Um, and so uh, if we can reduce methane, that can reduce the formation of tropospheric ozone in the atmosphere and that will have health benefits um, as well as um, agriculture and ecosystems benefits as um, outlined in this infographic and about 42 percent of methane comes from agriculture uh, over a third from fossil fuel operations and 18 uh, percent from waste something of that order this is data from the climate and clean air coalition so you can see that mitigation both of carbon dioxide and short-lived climate pollutants like methane can be health beneficial. <laughs> Excuse me. So it's also important to recognize that um, asthma in children can be related to air pollution, particularly nitrogen dioxide, which is particularly emitted through fossil fuel use and land transportation and power generation, and to some extent also from the combustion of solid biofuels in households. And a paper we did a couple of years ago, led by our colleagues at the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry in Mainz, um, showed that we could attribute about 14% uh, of the incident cases of asthma in children and adolescents worldwide to ambient air pollution, um, mainly, as I say, related to um, uh, fossil fuel use and other human sources. So again, in moving towards clean renewable energy, one can reduce the health burden uh, from this particular um, outcome and mechanism. Not all uh, net zero policies can benefit um, air quality. There's sometimes there's trade-offs. Um, and this slide is taken from a Royal Society report a couple of years ago. And it shows you that how on, on the right side, the green arrow is better air quality. And on the left side, the orange arrow indicates poorer air quality. And whilst most of these net zero policies improve air quality, some of them could have trade-offs. So, for example, the use of um, biofueled engines, <laughs> of uh, bioprops, of building energy efficiency. If you uh, insulate houses and stop drafts and airflow, reduce ventilation, of course, you can increase um, the inhalation of pollutants indoors. And some biofuel en engines can also, of course, increase air pollutants. So one always has to be aware that there may be trade-offs and that policies have to be carefully designed to maximize the benefits to health uh, and to the climate. And this slide also illustrates the carbon capture and storage, which of course is very controversial because it hasn't been shown to be um, scalable uh, at a very large scale. And it has economic and environmental impacts. And also many people fear that it's used by the fossil fuel industry as an argument to continue exploiting fossil fuels. And depending on the technology you use, of course, um, uh, you, you could get an increase in, in air pollution uh, levels as well as a result uh, of the technology compared with clean renewable energy. So where are we going at the moment with global energy investment? You can see that um, the estimated figures for 2023, according to the IEA, show us that there is an um, increasing investment in clean renewable energy, but fossil fuels still actually get a large amounts of investment, as you can see here, uh, approaching uh, or around about um, a, a trillion dollars, something of that order. And in terms of the, the returns, uh, the oil and gas producers received about four trillion US dollars in 2022. So they're still doing extremely well at a time when we need to be cutting <coughs> emissions from fossil fuels very quickly, 7% year on year on year, which of course we're completely failing to do. So it's a mixed picture. 
There are in, in increased investments in clean renewable energy, but not sufficient. And oil and gas producers are still receiving vast amounts of um, income. Although, as I've said pretty well, you know, many of these policies have big benefits for human health, there are potential spillovers and negative effects. And one of them is the potential for uh, the effects of extractive industries, particularly in low income countries where they're often rather poorly regulated. And this just reminds us of the issues around cobalt mining, for example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, there have been studies showing um, exposure to heavy metals, DNA damage in children, occupational injuries, violence, increasing deforestation. But, of course, the um, other side of that coin is it's generating some local income, although, of course, it may not be very equitably distributed. So there are attempts to regulate this, to improve the well-being of the workforce, to regulate it more closely. Um, but uh, obviously, one needs to be vigilant to see whether those uh, improved, apparently improved, regulations are actually having a desired effect. And we need to address these spillovers in thinking about the clean energy transition. I haven't said much about food, not because it's not very important, but because I know that you've already been discussing food very um, extensively, and you'll be aware the Eat Lancet Commission, for example, a few years ago, proposed moving towards the planetary health diet with very uh, limited consumption of bread and processed meats and animal products in general. Um, and a high consumption of, of fruit, vegetables, nuts and seeds would have major health benefits, preventing perhaps 10 to 11 million uh, premature deaths by, by mid-century and also dramatically reducing the environmental footprint of the food system. And this is taken from a paper a couple of years ago by my, led by my colleague Pauline Schielbeek, um, published in BMJ Open, where they looked at data from uh, over half a million UK participants uh, in a number of cohort studies, multiple um, high quality data sets, and um, also some studies that have measured environmental footprints. And they showed that um, those uh, participants who had very moderate to high uh, adherence, intermediate to high adherence to the Eat Well diet recommendations, which again are broadly in line with high consumption of plant based foods and so on, um, compared with those who are very low adherence though these people had a 7% reduced risk of mortality and 30% lower dietary greenhouse gas emission reduction. <coughs> so um, it just demonstrates that there are people in the population already consuming diets that are substantially healthier and lower environmental footprints um, th than others. And so that's a sort of counter, if you like, to those people who say, oh, well, it's very difficult to achieve these kind of dietary changes. They can be achieved. And they are being achieved by some people in the population, but of course the challenge is to scale, to scale them up. Um, so this study is is uh, this work is taken from our colleagues uh, in IS Global, and um, uh, they've uh, been looking at the benefits of green space in cities, doing a number of systematic reviews and so on. And the left side <coughs> of the slide summarizes some of the findings. In the black text shows you where there's good evidence for health benefits. The grey text shows you where there's emerging evidence of health benefits, particularly for, for children. Um, and you can see that there are potentially a range of different um, physical and mental health uh, benefits. And they've developed this concept of super blocks, where they amalgamate nine city blocks into one large box, block, preventing traffic from vehicle uh, traffic from going through, and enhancing the environment for local people, enabling them to walk and cycle safely. And they've estimated that if they could scale this up to the whole of the city of Barcelona, there could be quite major benefits from improved physical activity, but also uh, reduced air pollution. The challenge, of course, as always, is to scale up. We and others have done uh, studies um, in a number of cities, Delhi, Sao Paulo, um, London, and in England and Wales more broadly, looking at the health benefits of active travel and low-carbon transport. Uh, and we've shown in these different environments different levels of benefit depending on the assumptions that you take about uh, the changes in travel patterns. And figure one at the bottom of the slide just shows the potential um, annual National Health Service expenditure, of, expenditure averted um, in England and Wales um, from increased active travel, assuming that the uh, urban population of England and Wales were, was uh, walking and cycling like the population of Copenhagen, which, of course, as you know, is a very active um, a city population. You can see the benefits in monetary terms, a little bit out of date now, but I think still interesting. About £17 billion over a 20-year period averted 
with the benefits going up over time from reductions in the burden of diabetes, dementia, heart disease, and, and so on. Uh, so these combined policies, if you make it possible to use public transport, reduce dependency on the private car, and uh, increase the potential for safe walking and cycling, can be substantially beneficial. And earlier this year, I published a study led by my colleague uh, James Milner, a modeling study, which was modeling the health benefits of achieving net zero by 2050 in England and Wales, following our Committee on Climate Change, which is the kind of official committee that advises the government, uh, following their, um, their proposals for achieving net zero in 2050. And they suggested, this, this paper suggested potentially an extra 2 million life years uh, over the next few decades, and in fact, even more if you have um, a very health focused uh, agenda, which makes a maximal use of the health care benefits. And these benefits come again from um, uh, changes in diet, exercise patterns, changes in air pollution, including household air pollution, actually, which is quite an important contributor uh, to this particular um, study. Better ventilation, better insulation. Also, a very interesting study done in uh, Australia. This is a a randomized trial um, of uh, the Victorian Healthy Homes program, where they looked at home upgrades to reduce energy use and improve thermal comforts. And so they randomized households to either have the upgrade before the winter months or after. <coughs> and they showed that those who were randomized to having the upgrade before the winter months saved nearly a thousand Australian dollars. They were less exposed to cold temperatures. Uh, for every one Australian dollar saved in energy, they saved ten dollars uh, in health. In other words, reduced consultations uh, with the healthcare uh, system. So that was quite an impressive study, showing both reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, <coughs> but also um, tangible improvements in human health uh, and reduced burden on the healthcare system. And then finally, nature-based solutions. These are generic titles. Some people don't like the terminology, but as it's widely used, I'll use it which are a whole basket of different approaches that try to um, protect nature, enhance nature, uh, also support regeneration, but also can improve sustainable development and in some cases also health itself. And so these are designed to protect and enhance biodiversity. They're locally appropriate. They should safeguard cultural and ecological rights, particularly of indigenous groups. And they're multifunctional. They can meet multiple objectives. And particularly, they can benefit health through provision of eco services like clean water, for example, or disease control, reducing the levels of, um, say, harmful um, contamination of water or uh, of uh, disease carrying vectors uh, and so on. So, there are multiple pathways, still not fully quantified in any way, but they're beginning to be mapped out through which these nature-based solutions can improve health and the climate. And then finally, the healthcare system itself. We're increasingly recognizing the healthcare system as a major contributor to the problem. About 5% of global emissions, if the healthcare system was a country, it would be the fifth largest emitter on the planet. And um, <coughs> over 70 countries are now committed to building health systems, which can be both climate resilient, but also low carbon and sustainable through the WHO Attach Alliance, which is illustrated here, and 14 countries have set a deadline of 2050 or earlier, at least 14, maybe a few more now, by which their health system will reach net zero. And a lot of work's going on at the moment to try to develop better metrics of this, to actually quantify uh, progress. Um, and of course, the important thing is, it's not just the energy supply to facilities, it's it's actually most of it are scope three, they're scope three emissions. Scope three are the supply chains. So it's working with the pharmaceutical industry, the medical equipment industry, and others. And then finally, in conclusion, let, let me just draw your attention to this, this report, which is actually being released today. We have a launch uh, following this event, <laughs> and um, it's just been published. It's just now open access on the Lancet uh, website. It's the report of the Pathfinder Commission, which I have the honor to co-chair with um, Helen Clark and Joy Fumafi, was set up to collate and assess uh, the health care benefits, uh, the near-term benefits um, of these um, greenhouse gas mitigation actions across sectors and to communicate findings uh, to inform policy and action. And it includes a synthesis of evidence, an umbrella review, of all the systematic reviews, real world evaluated examples because we were looking for implemented case studies and made some recommendations on the ways forward to a healthy net zero um, future. 
So you can access the Climate and Health Evidence Bank uh, through this QR code, which will give you an access to all the literature that we found through these overview of systematic reviews. Some of them need updating because they're a little bit out of date, but it shows you what's available currently and also gives you access to the various case studies that we've collected through various uh, calls for, for evidence. And one of the conclusions is that healthcare benefits must be fully incorporated into, into the delivery of the Paris Agreement, including through the nationally determined contributions which each country makes um, to the UNFCCC, the Framework Climate Convention, and the long-term low emission development strategies that they also file under the Paris Agreement, which really articulate the direction and their, of their ambitions, how they're going to be implemented, and the global stock take, which um, allows the UN system to publish the um, assessment of how we're actually doing. So lots that can be done, uh, both uh, at national level, but also at the global level. And then concluding, let me just um, offer this reflection that we need to ensure that we keep positive um, messages <coughs> coming forward, because I think it's all too easy to see climate change as a doom and gloom issue, which it can be conceived of, of course, we're all very concerned. But at the same time, there are opportunities to act, and we have to capitalize on those. Um, without being naively optimistic, it's very important, I think, to give clear strategies, clear indication of the kind of strategies that can be implemented, and to use the health benefits uh, as a motivator for change. And of course, if you value these co-benefits using standard um, economic valuation uh, <coughs> criteria, then in many cases they can help to offset partially or sometimes wholly the cost uh, of, of action. So this is a recent piece of work which shows how this positive framing can bolster public support, even amongst those individuals who may be relatively unconcerned or even skeptical um, uh, about uh, uh, climate change. So let me leave you on that positive note to emphasize that rapid action is absolutely crucial, both to adapt to and to mitigate climate change. And there are big benefits uh, from moving away from our current unsustainable pattern of development towards a healthy, net zero, more equitable economy. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we will have time for questions and answers. Quick session. One or two questions. So just think about while we are connecting, what question you would like to pose to Andy. Anything you would like to add there while we are waiting? Yeah. Um, <coughs> let me think. Yeah, I must say I can maybe start with also some reflections while we are waiting. I wrote down some things before. Um, that, that I was thinking that maybe we go until the, the very end. And this positive framing and hope, I guess it's really uh, also what we need. We need every little drop of hope in this world that we live in right now. So I do agree on that. And here we now have uh, Andy Haynes here with us. Welcome, Andy, and thanks so much for your presentation. We have a little time a quick, for quick questions now. Happy to see you there. Hope you feel better soon. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. So, Great. I would like to turn to you in the audience for a question or two. Yeah? Hi, thank you for uh, the very insightful presentation. Um, I've reflected that oftentimes the negative effects of climate change will unjustly affect low-income and vulnerable populations. So could you please elaborate or explain a little bit more about how the benefits of climate action mitigation are distributed? Yes, th thank you very much. That's a very important question. Um, and of course, the, the climate change, the benefits of climate change mitigation are both, as I showed in my brief lecture, both in terms of reducing the risks of dangerous climate change, but also uh, the near-term benefits, the co-benefits that, that I discussed. And these are distributed in, in different ways, depending on the strategy. So obviously, high-income countries have to cut their emissions most quickly because they are the most responsible for um, climate change as we're seeing it now. They are responsible <coughs> for a disproportionate share of the greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore, those co-benefits would fall on uh, th those, those countries. 
although the benefits of reducing dangerous climate change would uh, fall on the most vulnerable countries. But even those countries that currently have a very low per capita um, emissions of greenhouse gases will in future, depending on which trajectory of development they decide to go down, increase their emissions. And therefore, they will increasingly, of course, if they go down a high fossil fuel burning pathway, they will experience more air pollution from the burning of fossil fuels. And therefore, moving towards a, a net zero carbon pathway with more emphasis on clean renewable energy will benefit those countries as well. But of course, the real uh, challenge here is how to get the funding to those countries, how to ensure that they have the opportunity to develop along a net zero carbon pathway, as far as that's possible um, in the future. And that does require a much greater transfer of resources than we're seeing at the moment. As we know, the $100 billion a year that was promised in Paris, it may just have been reached according to recent reports, but it's been very, very slow. So that transfer of resources just hasn't been taking place at the right speed and the level that it needs to. Uh, nevertheless, there are benefits to low and middle income countries um, to moving towards net zero emissions, both in terms of creating more resilient um, and, and climate friendly societies, but also benefiting from reduced air pollution, improved diets and the other benefits that I've outlined. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else who would like to pose a question? Then I just would like you to ask you, Andy, about what's going on in National Health Service in England. Uh, do you have any comments about how the work proceeds? Yes, well, thank you. The National Health Service England, as you know, has a commitment um, to moving towards a net zero um, health, uh, health service. Uh, and it's it's been one of the very first really to make that commitment and it's building on many years of work um, by something called previously called the Sustainable Development Unit in the National Health Service, but now a much larger directorate, uh, which is focusing on decarbonizing the National Health Service. Um, there are basically, as you as you know, that there are a number of challenges with doing that. One is that it isn't just about the energy for buildings. Our grid has substantially decarbonized. It's still got some way to go because we still generate quite a lot of electricity uh, from from gas, not so much from coal. That's almost um, phased out, uh, although we, the government has recently given permission for a new coal mine to open for its own reasons. Um, but so the energy situation has improved, but the other parts of the emission uh, perspective are not are not so not such great improvements. And as you probably know, many of those emissions in healthcare systems are scope three emissions. So they're consumption based emissions. They are due to the pharmaceuticals that we consume, the medical equipment that we use and so on. And so every successful initiative has to work with those providers in the, um, largely in the private sector in many countries that provide these products that the healthcare system uses. And I believe that the NHS has made some good headway uh, with establishing uh, partnerships or good communication with partners and also setting their procurement criteria so that in future uh, they will be procuring supplies from those uh, <coughs> those companies that can actually uh, ensure that their emissions are, are greatly reduced. So I think uh, although we don't have very recent to my knowledge quantitative data uh, it has been making substantial progress and we look forward to seeing the data in the near future. Absolutely and thank you so much for that answer and telling us a bit about that. So thanks for joining us today and good luck with the launch event coming soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you and now it's time to move on to our final speaker of the day or oh, what a day it has been very intense uh, but I think it has been very educational and we look forward to learning some more uh, so uh, Professor uh, Francesco Fuso Nerini from KTH is going to continue on this same topic of co-benefits between uh, climate and health and uh, he's uh, going to talk about some cases from EU and sub-Saharan Africa yeah, thank you, Rona. And I think uh, Professor Haynes gave us a very good overview of this kind of co-benefits that are there, and I hope to 
add something by providing a couple of cases where actually coordinated policy has uh, a lot of benefits. Uh, and fourth, maybe uh, even broadening the picture, uh, this is a review that we published in 2019, basically looking at how climate action, so SDG number 13, has either synergies or trade-offs with each one of the 169 targets of the Sustainable Development Goals. Long story short, we did 169 small studies. You can see here a summary of the results and uh, each one of the boxes next to the SDG shows if we found either a synergy or a potential trade-off with that target. Um, and of course, broadening the picture, it's uh, climate, it's health, but we also find that uh, action to address climate change has synergies with the achievement of around 80% of all targets of the Sustainable Development Goals that we could find. And of course, some important trade-offs, for instance, uh, uh, it will impact fossil fuel dependent economies and so on. Uh, but of course here we focus on health uh, and health is uh, a very strong entry point for climate action and vice versa. And I think we, we've heard a lot of these impacts today uh, and about the co-benefits, for instance, reducing pollution that uh, uh, results in reduced health issues. Uh, reducing extreme events that we see more and more around the world that create, of course, large health issues again, and also limiting transmission of diseases. Uh, maybe just a couple of words uh, to let you know what we are doing at KTH more broadly. This kind of SDG interlinkages and how do we harmonize climate with all these other priorities is the entry point for the center. This news well, new center is a couple of years old, it's called Cl Climate Action Center that works with research education, but especially partnerships uh, on advancing uh, climate action. And to date it encompasses uh, over 100 researchers in a variety of fields. Uh, because as you already understand, uh, we need uh, quite an array of different disciplines to uh, advance uh, climate action across all these uh, uh, priorities. Um, and just a couple of examples of things that we are doing. We are working a lot in the, let's say, international arena. For instance, uh, working with uh, uh, project supports. Oh, maybe it's here. Yes, <laughs> uh, project supports around the world. Uh, looking at how, for instance, if we are building a large renewable energy project that contribute to climate, how does it affect the achievement locally of all these other sustainable development priorities? Uh, we, are we are creating uh, data-driven tools to help climate and energy planning. Um, and we're also working quite a lot on uh, how to use AI uh, and new digital tools for advancing climate goals. And also this is something that just started uh, last year, but uh, hopefully very promising. We're starting a collaboration with, uh, with the other universities, let's say, in the Stockholm constellation, uh, on climate and health. So uh, we have, of course, uh, Bolin with a very strong uh, part of climate sciences. Uh, we have uh, Karolinska that looks, of course, at, at the health effects. And then uh, as a KTH, maybe it's a bit more on the action and mitigation, uh, so, sorry, the adaptation and mitigation solutions, both on the technologies and on the policy side. Uh, but without further ado, I would like to share insights from a couple of studies that we did uh, in the past years, and especially focusing on the issue of energy poverty. Uh, the first study uh, looks at uh, the European Union, and the second study looks at Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and this is, uh, I would say, quite complementary to what Professor Haynes was uh, highlighting, uh, but with a, a specific view of energy poverty. So. I don't know how many of you are aware that uh, around 50 million people in Europe uh, last year were experiencing some form of energy poverty. Energy poverty meaning not being able to keep their houses warm, uh, not being able to afford electricity. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, uh, linked to health outcomes. So uh, not being able to keep your house warm is the, has been linked to wider health issues, including excess winter deaths. Uh, poor mental health, and there's been even cases uh, where unaffordable el electricity uh, was uh, affecting the ability of uh, vulnerable customers or vulnerable people in the health side 
to even uh, uh, use their energy consuming health assisting uh, technologies. Um, and uh, I'll not go too much in detail, but uh, in, in these publications, we looked at what are the co benefits of addressing energy poverty, climate action, and of course, health uh, outcomes. Um, and uh, one thing that is uh, quite interesting is that all of these can be addressed together and is also um, inequality issues because, uh, as uh, it is often the case, uh, the poorest people are the one bearing most of the costs of any of these uh, uh, changes and disasters. So we see energy poor households in Europe uh, uh, having disproportionately higher energy costs. So maybe living in very inefficient houses that uh, need a lot of uh, energy to be kept warm and that of course is more expensive. <coughs> or even not knowing exactly how to access uh, uh, market tariffs for electricity and then paying more than, let's say, more, um, well, uh, richer uh, customers. Um, and here, again, we see how energy, climate, and health policies can go hand in hand, where measures, for instance, for retrofitting and making more efficient homes uh, increases uh, uh, climate action, addresses pollution, and of course has health benefits. Uh, and the same, for instance, for measures to in include the renewable-based heating. Um, and this, of course, the last point we heard from uh, Professor Heinz, how reducing pollution uh, has been actually the entry point in several countries and cities uh, for uh, also a lot of reducing emissions that address climate change. So reducing pollution to improve health outcomes in uh, well, in China is the most famous, but uh, of course also in European cities. Uh, one example is the city of Barcelona, where that entry point has resulted then in, in also good climate outcomes. So there was uh, a first example at the European Union, but then looking at a, a different, very different energy poverty issue in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware that around uh, 2.3 billion people in the world uh, still cook with traditional ways. Uh, traditional ways being uh, gathering firewood or purchasing some charcoal and, and uh, uh, burning it in a, uh, mo most often in an unsustainable way, uh, which has uh, a lot of repercussions around, again, all sustainable development goals. This is another review that we did uh, in 2018 looking at uh, how uh, energy access relates, or modern energy relates to all the SDGs, and again, similar results to, to the climate one. But if we focus on uh, uh, clean cooking, we see how, of course, uh, there are a lot of health outcomes with uh, around 70% of the indoor air pollution related deaths in Sub-Saharan Africa related to uh, this issue. And there are a lot of other uh, issues related to it, especially gender equality uh, in uh, uh, some of these countries. On average, uh, most times women and children spend uh, over one hour a day collecting firewood. This is a picture we took in uh, rural Kenya. Uh, time that could be spent uh, well to, to do other things. And of course, then it's, it's also an, an economic barrier. Um, so what we did... Uh, um, led at KTH, but also with partners at the, the UN Clean Cooking Alliance. And it has been applied for policy support, first in Nepal, and this year we are working with the government in uh, Kenya, uh, looking at how we could uh, switch from uh, these traditional ways of cooking to more sustainable ways of cooking, uh, which could be cooking with electricity, but in some cases also, in some cases also with gas or just with improved stoves. Um, and this is a, a large study that we did that we published this year in Nature Sustainability, which is a geospatial study. So basically, for each square kilometer of the subcontinent, we looked at uh, what are the opportunities or, let's say, the costs and benefits to transition from these traditional ways of cooking to other ways of cooking. Uh, finding quite interestingly that uh, while around 80% of the people in the subcontinent cook in these uh, unsustainable ways, if we take into account the health costs, the greenhouse gases costs, 
and um, and the opportunity cost of this time that is uh, spent for collecting firewood, not a single person in the continent should be uh, cooking in that way. So there is a big market failure where, uh, let's say, governments or the situation, but also in some cases, uh, uh, behaviors, have influence in the situation that, that it should not be the case. Uh, there is a reason why in many other countries uh, nobody cooks in, in this way. Uh, and then we look at, uh, well, the, first of all, uh, how we could look in 2030 if we look at the most benefits, so how we could uh, give uh, access with, uh, uh, to modern cooking with electricity or LPG. And also we looked at uh, the broad uh, uh, context where if we would uh, achieve universal access to clean cooking, uh, we could uh, save almost half a million lives per year in the sub-Saharan continent. Uh, we could avoid a lot of health costs, around 4% of the sub-Saharan African GDP. <coughs> but also we could save uh, a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So around uh, uh, 600 uh, uh, megaton of CO2, around 2% of the global emissions, which is quite a lot for such, a, such an issue. And what is also interesting is that uh, this is some of the cheapest way to decrease emissions that we find in the world. So each megaton of CO2 avoided here will cost much less than reducing the same in Sweden or in Europe. Uh, Yes, so that's all, and I hope that provided a couple of interesting uh, other examples of, uh, yeah, benefits of coordinated action. Thank you. <laughs> Perfectly uh, on time as well, which is an achievement given this late time of the day. I think <laughs> that we all become a bit more loose in our sort of uh, time management. Are there any quick questions to Francesco? Yes, please. Yeah, it was a really interesting talk. It's more, I suppose, maybe a comment than a question, but just I thought it was great that you were emphasising the importance of having retrofitting alongside clean renewable fuels because there's a there's a danger of you know insulating properties, but that still people are burning solid fuels and you then have issues with indoor air pollution. Um, so yeah, just thank you for flagging that, and I think it's good to be tying that into that indoor air pollution um, issue because I think that's that's sort of something we need to do more on yeah. in the future. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Then let's thank Francesco once again. <laughs> now it's time for the final re reflections, concluding remarks, <laughs> as we said. I don't know. Maria, I think you say what has do been... you have? It has been good for my mental health, I would say. <laughs> Just listening to all those nice and interesting presentations. Last week, or maybe the week before, I was in Berlin on the Falling Wall Science Summit. And we have four researchers speaking about planetary boundaries, mostly planetary health. And my, my input was on climate change and health. And there was this young guy sitting in front of us. And he came for. he posed a question. I could see that it was really difficult for him to pose this question because of anxiety. And he came forward afterwards and said, I think this was really good because it was, you stressed the urgency, the importance, but you gave hope. I know now that there are several researchers who work really hard on those issues from the presentation examples we did. And I have the same feeling being in this room, that we are many people working in this important area. So that's one reflection. Yeah, it actually connects very well to what I also kind of wrote down. Because and connects also that it's not only as researchers, but it's also the policy sector. Mm -hmm. um, I, I picked up this urgency and opportunity from uh, Matthias Rimaris. Yeah. Uh, presentation and I think that those are really good uh, keywords um, and also I think Marco mentioned this that we choose our path I mean I guess that that's another reflection that came here this need for hope but also need for empowerment that we still yeah we have to act urgently um, but we choose what mm -hmm. we do 
Um, and then I think another reflection that came to me was also the kind of importance of communication, the way that we talk to each other, the way that we talk with each other, we, the way that we have spoken to each other in this room. I think mm -hmm. one of the really uh, nice outcomes of today, which we had no way to anticipate, actually, or know how it's going to go, has been the quality of interaction that we've seen. Uh, it's been very good discussions. We're very happy to have seen so uh, vivid and intellectual discussion in this room and outside this room. And uh, it's exactly what we need uh, to move forward in these questions. And, also somehow this like importance of communication and how we pose questions, how we frame problems, how we frame questions. For instance, this uh, air pollution and climate link. Do we frame it with the climate penalty, uh, which is one side of the coin, or do we frame it with the co-benefit that you know actually a lot of the sources that are sources of greenhouse gases are also sources so. Uh, pollutants. One of my teachers that I had, he said early on that the door needs to be open from inside if you want to change something. And I think that is also mm -hmm. connecting to what you say about the narratives we give. And um, believe it or not, but research on communication regarding climate change and health it is, you don't find that much. So this is a very important research area to come. But one of the people who, who are excellent in this research field, he also said repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat again. And of course that is wonderful if there are so many disciplines joining this because we, that's what I felt also today, we touch upon each other. So our narratives will be complementary, I guess. Yes, indeed, exactly. And somehow I think from a, then a final reflection from my side, I think as a kind of a representative of the climate community, if you may, um, I think that there is an immense opportunity for us also um, in this connection to the health to communicate and maybe motivate the needs that we, or the things that we need to do with health. Um, because... Uh, we all care about our existence. Absolutely. And where you are, when you ask people around the world, do surveys, <clears throat> health almost always come on the top when you talk about what is important in their lives. Your own health, of course, but yeah. also the ones you love and that you have in your life. So I think it's, I, I agree with you. <laughs> Okay, maybe that was enough from I us. I think so. Time is also ticking, and I know that you are probably tired. At least I am, I can <laughs> admit. Um, but are there any final reflections or questions or comments from the audience that you didn't have the chance to say or speak out during the sessions? Unfortunately, we don't have all the speakers in the room, but maybe there is still time to ask also if if there are some final remarks. Yes, Francesco. Just uh, thanking you and, and all the organizing team. Uh, I think it covered a lot of different topics on how climate and health are interrelated and it's difficult to find such a, let's say, comprehensive overview in, in one day. So yeah, thank you for providing that for us. Thanks a lot. And I think also that's one of the things that we discussed and struggled a lot is also this because we're talking about so complex topics that somehow influence all sectors of society. And fr apropos, frame, framing the questions, simplicity is also important. And somehow that's also something to think about. How can we simplify without compromising Absolutely. that accuracy? Absolutely. But yeah, also on that note, I follow up with the list of thank yous. So indeed, many thanks to all the speakers of today. We can soon give applause to everyone. I just list everyone. Yeah, so all the speakers today, uh, you did an amazing job. The moderators did an amazing job. Um, our KVA uh, team who has helped with uh, all the practicalities being so smooth. It has really been a pleasure to be here. I think that this environment has enabled us to interact in a best possible way yeah. 
and also um, everyone in the audience for participating and engaging, although it has been such an, in, such an in, intense day. So let us end with applause yeah, to absolutely. ourselves. <laughs>